Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, good, good to be back with you. So uh, we're going to talk about other post-employment benefits or OPEP. Uh, last time I was here, we walked through various levers or options you can uh, make to the plan. And this time, we've kind of packaged those into a few options for you um, and kind of quantified those. So, so with that being said, So, so I'm going to skip page three. Uh, I've, I've kind of talked about that while we've been here. Uh, and page four, just, just to reiterate, you know, I'm not a lawyer. I may play one on TV, but I don't win their legal <laughs> advice. Uh, I'm an actuary. Don't even want to play one on TV. <laughs> I probably don't even want to play one on TV. That's right. Uh, so I'm an actuary, and, you know, we, we'll model some numbers for you. But, you know, the numbers we model have based, been based on our best guesstimate or best estimate. And, you know, reality may be different than that. So let, let's talk about where you are currently. Um, and I think this is very important, that you put in a defined dollar benefit in 2012. At the time you put that in, that saved you roughly $110 million. So based on what I looked at, you cut your OPEP lobby almost in half when you put that in. Um, and, and that defined dollar fit limit has caps of uh, $1,130 for pre-65 retirees, $804 for the spouses, Repeat that. I missed the numbers. Okay. Yeah. You, you put in a, a, a defined dollar benefit or a DDB in 2012, and you say roughly $110 million when you put that in. It's the, uh, the, the first bullet there. I'm sorry. I'm on page six. six. Thank you. Everyone good? Okay. Uh, so, so I just wanted to kind of give you the history. You know, you put this in and first time I met with you, I was saying, you know, you were far ahead of the curve because most entities have not capped their OPEP costs like, like you had done. However, and I'm going to go down here to this, this second phase of the bullet, um, last year you have not been maintaining that defined dollar for that, that DDB. Um, you've been paying the, the premiums, and so you haven't been passing on an additional cost mainly to your pre-65 retirees. And if the, the policy isn't changed, we will have to value what you're actually doing for OPEP liability purposes. And I'll, I'll go through these on the next few pages, but essentially your OPEP liability is probably about to double at least. So you're probably looking at going from at the bottom of a roughly $190 million OPEP liability to where if you don't maintain your policy, almost $380 million. And going in the future, you'll see it gets into the billions with the B. So uh, these next few pages just illustrate that. On, on page seven, we show you the actual cash flows by each group of what the benefit payments are going to be. On the dark green are your current retirees, and then the lighter green are your, your current actives. And as you can see, the future hires are way out there in the future because they've got to get to retirement before they start receiving those benefits. This assumes you maintain the DDB. So look what's happening if you don't. If you don't, your curve looks like most government entities I, I, I consult with. Most people have this curve that's, that's upwardly sloping because those benefits are increasing with medical inflation. And, and I'm assuming this is 4%, which is very generous. I mean, we know that medical inflation is going up higher than 4%, but I just wanted to illustrate for you just what even that 4% it does. But the 4% is a figure that's used over a 30-year period. Correct. Yes, sir. So it, it could be over 30 years we would average 4%. That's, that's true. Yeah, right. You so, look at it as a one-year. That's true. Yeah, right. So, so if you look at medical trend, you know, what we call the ultimate medical trend rate, it's usually somewhere around that 4 to 5% raise. Right. So long term, but you know, I've been doing this like 20 years. 
And we've been saying the ultimate trend is going to be five for those 20 years. <laughs> and I'd be doggone if it's not going up higher than that most of those you years. You the bad years. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> But, but the point is that if, if you don't maintain the DDB, that, you know, you're going to have this upward sloping um, benefit payments. So now let's look at the liability. You know, and again, I talked about when, you, when I'm on page nine here. When, when you make the change, you know, you put your liability in half. And you also kind of stabilize the liability where um, it essentially almost remains relatively flat, if you look at it, kind of like the, the benefit payments. And you can see it's roughly $200 million, we'll call it today, and expect it to maintain around that point. But if you look at page 10, this is what I was talking about getting into the billions, that if the DDB is not maintained, then you're looking at in 30 years having a liability of you know, $1.2 billion in a billion dollar range. So instead of having a liability of you know, so roughly $200 million 30 years from now, we're looking at having a liability that's probably a billion more. So I, I know that you know, I've gone through this before, but I just want to kind of set the stage of why we're here to talk about that. Okay. So now let's look at what kind of options do you have available. So, so we've labeled the option option one, two, and three, not because of that's your first option, second option, or third option. But what we've done is labeled the option that has the most significant impact or the most significant impact on your current work group, all the way down to the ones that have the least impact. So uh, j just to highlight option one, so what this option does is it assumes that, okay, you've got $48 million sitting aside to quote fund OPEB. So what if you just took that $48 million and said, we'll fund OPEB until the money's gone? You know, again, that, that, that is, will be the most significant probably thing you could do besides just totally turning it off. Then what happens to that? You know, of course, your liability is limited to that $48 million. Um, but the issue is that that would only allow the plan to operate for five or six years. Would you put, put that $48.7 million into a trust, or would you leave it in just bank account to use it? Cash flow the city. I think Jeff wants to spend it, so we're leaving his bank account. Mm. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, it, it would honestly for for this purposes of this option, it really wouldn't matter much because you're gonna be you're gonna be taking out roughly nine to ten million dollars a year, so you won't be able to invest the money really that long term anyway. And also, given that the restrictions South Carolina has on investments, mm -hmm. it, it just really wouldn't for this option. It really wouldn't matter because literally, what we're assuming here is you take the forty eight million and you just drain it down essentially. And so, Eric, you're saying yeah. after your, your five to six year estimate is based on kind of the current trends of Correct. what we're playing. So five to six years after it's depleted, then we wouldn't have any more obligations. You wouldn't have the, any right. The retirees. Correct. Um, and I guess, do we have an estimate on knowing where we are currently with our retirees about how many more would be in the system at that point? I can... Uh, You've got roughly 700 now. I can tell you go to five years. If After this meeting, I can go look up and tell you exactly how many. Um, we have that number. I just don't have it in the top of my head. But, I, but, but, but literally, you know, not only would your current retirees be impacted, then, you know, pretty much anyone who's active today probably will unlikely to get a benefit. You know, and again, this is the most significant option out there. So I started with this one. I'm not saying this is the first one, but just to give you some perspective of, you know, so, so essentially that would just cap your OPEP liability at $48 million. The other thing I want to point out with this option, too, um, and, and this gets into all these options, we're assuming that you establish what we call an HRA, a health reimbursement account. You know, I talked to you about your current policy, how you're paying the premiums. With the health reimbursement account, you would deposit that $1,100 or $840 to a dependent into an account, and they would go out there and then uh, purchase right. their own coverage. Right. So, so, that, so that would essentially get you out of having to pay the difference in the premiums and all those. So all the options I'm going to show you assume that you establish what we call an HRA. Eric, th th yes, these sir. options were put together, I understand, um, based on interviews that they've had with counsel as they will. One of the options that's not up there is eliminating spouse coverage altogether, uh, not, not just for the ones that can have cover, offered coverage elsewhere, but eliminate it. Spouse and dependent, and only insure our employees. C correct. So, so, go ahead. I'm sorry. And that would be a significantly more uh, savings for the city if we did that. It, it would if so. so under yeah, option one, so looking at the other option, if you did that, it would add a little bit more savings. Um, I don't know if it would be what I would call it significantly more, uh, but just because, I, if I remember correctly, I think your 
your current dependents, you're paying somewhere in the, the million and a half million dollar range, I think. Um, and so if you just totally eliminate them, you would add that. Now, going forward, you know, it, it would add more savings just as more retirees, as more current employees retire. Is there an equity issue here between the employees that are single and the employees that have house independence? It's a good question. Um, Based on, well, before, before you answer that, clarify the question, because we're talking about retiree coverage. We're not talking about active. Well, it's just as important on the retiree side as it is on the active side. But there's two differences, because we had this discussion earlier. The discrepancy is so a single employee can cost us more than a whole family in any year based on their claims. Mm -hmm. So unless you have the claim data, you can't answer that question. Well, the liability is more if you have four people. Not necessarily. Year. So so a family of four makes no claim in a year, but an individual has a two renal failures or something like that it's cost three hundred thousand dollars how do you how do you say that's not i mean but an that's what i'm saying an actuary unless you doesn't look at, at claims an actuary looks at what's possible based on a uh, yeah but we have, we, we're making but we're making decisions on historical we have historical data for creation so to to say i think that's that's a loaded question you got to have the data to stand up to that I'm actually going to agree with both of you. How about that? <laughs> um, you're right. You're running for office? No, sir. I am not. Absolutely not. <laughs> I, I would say that you're correct. We will look at the claims of those dependents to see if they're paying their true cost. So, so, so that, that does go into effect. And I, I would say the way your plan is set up now, you're paying you know, $1,100 for the retiree, 840 for the dependents. So I assume you put that in to try to try to balance that equity issue. You know, again, that that was put in before I got here, and we haven't looked at the claims, but that's why I assume you made that differential, but, you know, so. Well, you know, and I think there's a, uh, there's a big line of distinction between pre and post-65 as well, as, as we know. I mean, our, our, our pre-65s are our, our biggest liability right. at this point and our biggest claims. Right. right. Uh, we're on page uh, 13 there, but into uh, so, so that was option one. I'll, I'll just keep going through the option, and then we've got another page that kind of makes it a little clear. On option B, 1B, uh, we assume that you eliminate post-65 coverage for, um, for that same group, and, and also you remove that restriction of having to uh, limit the amount of the $48.7 million. The only option that limits the liability to $48.7 million is the first option. And then option 1C assumes that, um, that we would now restrict it to only those current active employees who are eligible to retire before the end of the year. So, so the first option kind of affects everyone. Option 1B, we start mo removing post 65. And then option 1C, we only restrict it to those current active employees who will be eligible to retire end of the year. And, and I'll go on to, to option 2. So, so, so on option two, we, we don't touch the, re the current retirees. Here we look at the current active employees and your future hires. Again, we establish the HRA. Uh, you know, we eliminate that spousal coverage for those who have credible coverage. And, and for purposes of our numbers, we've only assumed 25% have credible coverage. So essentially, the numbers we've modeled almost essentially, they, they've been removed anyway. And, uh, and then we extend eligibility and put an age requirement to, to get the benefit in option two. And then in option three, we look at only for future hires. What if you don't touch any current retirees or current active employees? What if you only do changes for future hires? Option three just takes it together all the way, right? Like what if we only offer the benefit, don't offer anything to the, the future hires pre or post 65? And then option 3B only offers our pre-65 coverage. So on, on page 14, this is probably a, a little easier to see it. You can kind of compare the options all together. And again, you know, I said that we arrange these by which has the most impact or the most change. As you can see the first op option impacts everyone, just because once the fund runs out, everyone will be impacted. Option 1B only affects those uh, future hires, current active employees, and those, those pre-65ers. We will remove post-65 for those current employees. 
And then we, we go on and down the list. And you can see option two actually impacts your current active employees and your future hires. And then three is only future hires. So any questions kind of about what the mechanics of the options are, we can go on to look at some of the numbers. Let's see, let's see the numbers. Okay. So, so I'm, I'm going to skip page 15. It just talks about how we quantify the numbers. And again, I'll show you on the immediate impact, which is really like your impact on your budget next year, then more intermediate and then longer term impact. So, so he, here are the numbers. So again, option one, as I said, you know, it, it, it's the most changed, so it has, of course, the biggest impact. Um, and so I just want to talk a little bit about this $19 million of savings that on option one, what we assume is that you wouldn't put any money in your budget. You wouldn't fund anything for retired medical. You would take that $48 million out of the trust and totally use that to, to drain down the fund. So that will open up two avenues for you. You wouldn't be funding the $9 million in benefit payments that you currently do, nor would you be funding anything in the budget. So that's why that number is so large that if you did that, essentially, you would almost essentially begin out of the retired medical business, but you would just use that $48 million just to, to pay claims until it's gone. So, so again, you know, that has, that has the, the biggest impact. Uh, option 1B, where you eliminate post-65 coverage, you see immediately next year you're going to save about $9 million with that option. And all the way down. And option three, the option for future hires, they don't have any impact on the immediate budget because those employees aren't hired yet. So, so now I'll skip all the way to the far right and look at the impact over the 30 years. Uh, so, so if you look at, you know, option three, you know, you would trim your OPEP liability, you know, roughly, and these are in today's dollars. You, you would trim the OPEP liability roughly, you know, 28 to $30 million would changes to future hires. Now, in the option two, you would almost create about the same amount of savings if you touch current and active employees. So, so I'm going to pause there and kind of let this soak in and see if we got any questions on any of the options or any of the numbers we have here. On C, where you say fund up, what, do you have a projection on that? Or So, so on what, what option 1C would do, you would – you would just continue to fund the HRA, essentially. Okay. Yeah, that, that's, that's what we we're saying here is that I just want to delineate that from option one where you aren't doing any other additional funding. Option 1B and the rest of the options, you just continue to fund the HRA. So above and beyond the 48 million? Yes, yes. So, so in, in theory, any option besides one, the 48 million is still there to you know, either pay for other benefits or whatever – you know, the city's pleasure is. If we don't have any impact on the numbers, I do want to talk about what the impact on the employees will be and some of the retirees. Okay. So uh, let's go through the health care delivery. Um, I do want to just highlight a few things here about the differences in the market. You know, we talked about your pre-Medicare, your pre-65 pre retiree versus the Medicare retirees. And what we, so let me first define what we call the individual market. Currently now you have a group plan. You know, employees go through the city to get their coverage in, in a group basis. Uh, with ACA, we created this whole individual market. And, and there are kind of two exchanges. There's the public exchanges, what the state has, and there's also private exchanges. So, so I refer to that as the individual market. The individual market for pre-Medicare retirees is, is not as stable as it is for Medicare retirees. Um, you know, we can get into all the reasons, a lot of them we list here. But, but, but that population there, you know, again, that's your highest cost population. And it, 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 I'll, I'll show you the claims and the, I mean, the premiums, but that population is not as stable as the post-Medicare retirees. Um, the, the, the Medicare retirees, you know, first of all, Medicare is a primary payer. Um, there are several public and private exchanges for them, and their premiums aren't increasing as fast as these pre-Medicare retirees. And, and we list a lot of the reason kind of why here, but, but that, that is just the, the premise I just want you to take away as we get into the numbers to start thinking about that. Do you think that the uh, pre-Medicare market is going to stabilize and, and be re-strengthened in what, years? What, what I've been told is that that pre-Medicare market is just still in such a state of flux mm -hmm. because, you know, that, that is just our, for everyone, that is our, our highest cost people in that that market is just still hasn't been stabilized. And so, um, you know, as I, when I show you the premiums, you'll be able to see it, that they're going to have high premiums, um, you know, 
talk about that trend rate of four percent. That group is probably having trend, you know, double of everyone else. Now, now that's not to say that at some point it could, but from what I've been told by all of our experts is that that market is just still in a state of flux. Any other questions on pre Medicare versus post Medicare? Okay. So, so we, we did what we call a footprint to look at all your pre Medicare retirees. You got roughly four hundred. Where do they live? and what choices of plans are available to them. And so you can see most of your employees live in, in Richland and in Lexington. You've got a few sprinkled out you know, throughout the country. Um, but if you look at the choice of plans, the thing I want to point out is that look at the number of platinum plans offered. There's almost none existent for where most of your retirees live. Most of the plans for the pre-Medicare retirees are these bronze or, or silver plans. <laughs> Except for Florida. <laughs> Can we, Good old Sunshine State, can right? We mandate that all of our retirees move to Volusia, Florida. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I think you, you can do that. You've got that one retiree who would have options everywhere, right? He's got 13 platinum plans, a lot of silver plans. And the cost is lower. The, and the cost is lower. The cost is lower. So Volusia no state taxes, but, but you've only got one retiree there. But for, but for most of your retirees, you know, they would be subject to either a silver or gold plan. Um, but look on the far right, the number of carriers available too. You know, you know this, we've talked about this, that you know, in the state of South Carolina, there's only one carrier available. So there's one game in town. You got several different types of plans, but if you know if you prefer something other than the blues, you've got to move to Volusia, right? <laughs> Maybe that's why he moved. Or she moved. Uh, so, so so this just gives you a picture of where your retirees live and what the choices are available. On the next page. Let me, let me ask a question. Yes, sir. 194, is that all? Or is that a... That, that, that's all you have in, in, in Richland County. You've got 136 in, in Lexington. Oh, now, now, we're only talking about those pre-65ers. Right. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. it. Yeah. But, you know, but if you look at that, that's roughly uh, 230 out of, you know, that's over half of them live in those two counties, yeah. you know. And then, then you know, they, they start scattering out. On page 20, um, I just kind of show you some of the details of the different plan designs. But the thing I want to point out here to you is look at what the, the far right columns, where we show you the actual premiums. So, so, so these are the premiums um, that, that are currently, as of 2018, on the exchanges. So if you look at if your employee, your current plan is between a gold and a platinum plan. So it's not exactly a gold, it's not exactly a platinum. It's right between those two. But if you look at where a current pre-65 retiree in Richland County, they'd be paying roughly $1,250 a month for premiums. And, and you can see the premiums fluctuate, like you know that gentleman down in Volusia County. Pre-65. Correct, pre-65. You know, that gentleman down, or, or Mrs. down in Volusia County, you can see their premiums are, are a lot cheaper for that same gold plan. I recognize that Florida has a, a very high um, retiree population. Mm -hmm. Move to Florida and uh, that kind of stuff. But um, I mean, what what's the rationale for that? Is it they have more providers, so the competition is bringing the cost down, or what? I mean, what is dictating that? And is there anything we can learn from them? They they well, you know, it is re pre retirement state, preferable retirees. They, they do have more providers. We look at that other page, and and Florida they had like five providers. So I'll go back there. So, yeah. Is that probably competition that's yeah, keeping that cost you, down? Yeah, you, you've, got, you've got the competition, and if you've got a market where, where there's a ton of retirees, they've got more to pull it over and just more experience. I mean, they, that, that, that state is just, you know, most people retire from other places and move to Florida. And then you've got other places in Ohio, which also has a lot of carriers. And, you know, when you've got more competition, you tend to have those lower premiums. But it's also based on, also the last thing I'll add, is based on the health of that general population. You know, um, you know I, I live in Atlanta and here in the South, and, you know, our, our eating habits probably aren't the best. So if you start looking at, if you mix Florida, maybe you've got retirees from all over, and maybe, you know, their, their habits are maybe different than ours who, you know, stay primarily in the areas where we're born and raised. Did they answer your question? Okay. Um, here we look at, the, I talked about the premiums. Um, so if we go to page 21, I just want to show you what the impact would be on a particular employee. 
So, so your average pre-65 employee is age 58. Here I've just shown you age 60 just for illustrative purposes. So if you look at the total premium, I talked about that $1,200, you know, roughly $50, I mean, the $1,242 for the gold plan, right? So your current defined dollar benefit will pay them for $1,130. So they will be net out of pocket $122. Now, you know, you may say, well, $122 doesn't sound like a lot, but compare it to the 16 they're paying now, you know, they're going to be paying roughly $100 plus dollars more. Now, again, this is for retirees age 60. You've got some retirees that are younger who would pay less, and you've got some that are older who would pay more. At the very oldest end of the range, those age 64 retirees, they would be paying roughly $100 more than this. You know, and I'll call it roughly. We show those in the appendices. Yeah, they'd be paying you know, roughly, roughly $250. So, so you're looking at, if you send them to the individual market for the pre-65, you're going to go from paying roughly $16 to, you know, electing a similar plan, you know, roughly $122. And, um, you know, and just something to point out. So, so let's assume that you had maintained your defined dollar benefit last year, right? If you look at the premiums of your current plan, and these are equivalent premiums, it's not far off from the gold plan. The, the difference is that the city's picking up much more of the cost for your retirees, and so they're net out of pocket, you know, their premiums is, is, is a lot smaller. So, so it, it, it's, it's, this just kind of highlights the fact that, you know, not maintaining that defined dollar benefit, the city's taking on much more of the cost, you know, and the retiree's paying less. But, but if you were to send them to the exchange and implement the defined dollar benefit, then they would, you know, be paying more. But the premiums aren't that much different between your group paying and the individual market, a little bit lower. How do we collect that $16 now? Is that how do we collect that $16 premium per month from a retiree now? Because they get in state retirement. That's health. That's health insurance. It's a health insurance premium. We have an administrator that's the health insurance premium. We have an administrator that they pay. They write their checks to or they get it um, deducted from their checking accounts. Okay. Yeah, so they pay their premiums like, you know, if they were an employee, of course, you pay out their check. But because they're retired, And, and, you know, the, the base plan, we'll call it, that, that plan, like I said, between the gold and the platinum plan. And a retiree could have the option of buying a lower tier plan and, you know, and essentially paying, you know, no out-of-pocket dollars if they bought a gold or very little if they bought a silver plan. But to buy what I'll call a, quote, you know, almost equivalent plan, you're going to be paying, you know, $100 plus dollars more. So uh, any questions on, on this example before we go on? So now let's look at your, your Medicare retirees. We go through the same analysis, uh, and you know, not much different. You know, m most of your Medicare retirees are, are still you know right around these two counties in, in Richland and Lexington. You know, almost the same as the pre-Medicare retirees. But if you look at the number of plans they have, there's a lot more options. You know, and I talked about that market being much more stable. So you know, I think some of you in insurance, and you know, insurance companies are in the business of risk management. And if they feel like they can take on a risk that, that they can uh, manage, they'll offer you a lot of plans and, and offer you coverage. And that's why on the pre-65, you don't see as many. But on these post-65, you see much more plans. Uh, just because with Medicare being the primary payer and all those, you know, insurance companies are in that game. So, again, they have much more options. Uh, so we'll go through the example if anybody had any question around that. Um, so, so in this case, and, and this is probably the silver lining for your, your Medicare retirees. So currently, um, they're, uh, they're paying roughly $216 for the current plan. And I'll skip through all this stuff. Because they, the premium is roughly $516. The defined dollar benefit is $300. So that leaves them with like roughly $200 out of pocket, $216. If they were to go to the individual market, and, and I've shown a plan that's kind of similar, you can see that they would actually be paying less. 
you know, significantly less. And, and that's probably a function of probably two or three things. One, you know, that market is much more stable. Two, uh, you probably got some cross subsidization where some of those retirees are subsidizing the pre 65ers, and doing this would, would break that. Um, and so those Medicare retirees, you know, would in theory on the individual market, you know, probably do better or much better. So, you know, someone asked me if I had good news this morning. There's a good news. <laughs> and Eric, you have, yes, you have down there uh, the example is a, someone age 75. Mm -hmm. Does that change if someone is so Medicaid eligible age 65? No, no. They, so, so I just took the average of your post 65ers. I'm sorry. They, I think they're around 76. So I just want to show you what your average employee would be like. Right. I just want to make sure. I'm just, from my knowledge, I just want to know what this likely be the scenario for someone that's 66, 67. It would actually be better. Okay. So, so, so thank you. Good question. I, I need to point that out. So if you're younger than this, these numbers will get better, right? Like, so, so, so your out-of-pocket costs will go down. Those who are older, right, will be paying a little bit more. So let's say, I, I don't know if you'd be, still be living if you, to, to get to a, a criminal premium on the Medicare market, but, if, you know, if you're, say, 85, you'd be paying, uh, let's just call it about $100 more than this, but still less than the current plan. And, you know, and, and there are some changes. I'm not going to get into the prescription drugs. Medicare has a five-tier system. You've got four. So, so there would be some changes, but, but overall, they could get an equivalent plan for probably cheap. So, so now that I've gone through all this, so what's next? So, you know, in, in, in my mind, you, you've kind of got two paths that I'll choose, uh, or I'll, I'll kind of say. You've got... Uh, what I, I won't call it, I'll call it do nothing for sake of here, but, you know, no action. You've got two choices if you don't act and take one of the options today. Either one, you can increase those, you maintain the DDB and increase the premiums. Or you don't maintain the DDB and your OPEP liability goes up effective June 30th, 2018. It's going to hit the balance sheet this year because of GAFZ 75. So it just, you know, I hate to be cynical, but... You know, if you don't maintain the DDB, then we will have to value what you're doing, and the OPEP lobby is going to go up. Okay. The other option is we went through all these different options, you know, one through three and three A and three B. Uh, you know, you can amend the plan. And, you know, and that comes down to kind of, you know, what are your desired level of savings, and who do we really want to impact? So that's kind of why I structured it like that, to show you you can impact everyone all the way down to the future higher. And, you know, unfortunately, I'm not running for office, so, you know, those are policy decisions that, you know, that, that you all have to make in conjunction with your staff about who's, who's really going to be impacted. We've quantified the numbers for you, but, you know, but what type of savings are you looking to get next year, and then who do you want to impact? Once you decide which one of those paths to go down, you know, you've still got some communication to do. You know, if, if you're going to maintain the DDB and increase premiums, you need to be getting out ahead of that now. I've talked to to Pam and Missy and Jeff about, you know, making sure that you communicate that so it's not last minute to your retirees. And, or, you know, Jeff or, or Jan will need to be on the phone with your rating agencies if you don't maintain the DDB because, you know, they're going to wonder why is this OPEP liability, you know, two times as big as we thought it would be. It, now, if you do amend the plan, you've got a few more decision points to make. I talked about pre-Medicare and post-Medicare market and how which one was more stable, and we kind of showed that in premiums. Um, for the pre-Medicare, you probably didn't want to decide whether or not you want to send them to the individual market or do you want to keep them in the group plan with the HRA. So what I mean by that is that you could continue to offer the plan through the city, fund the HRA, but let them buy the plan through the city, but your cost is still limited to the HRA. That, that will give them a, a few more options and probably – uh, and, and then that way you can kind of blend them with active employees that lower their costs a little bit. Or you could just send them to the individual market and they pay those premium I showed you before. And then with the post-65ers, the biggest question uh, is do you go with the private exchange, which was, has more options, or do you go with the state exchange, which has one carrier? So, you know, a lot of decision points. You know, the first thing is, you know, big path are you going to go down? You know, do you want to make some action and move on some of these options? Or, you know, you're looking to amend the plan. And from there, you know, there, there's, there's other things that you've got to consider. Uh, and, and the last thing I'll leave you with, and, and, and I'll stop talking, is that if you're going to go to the individual market, you really need to be getting out ahead of that right now. Because it takes a while to get that implemented. 
get into cares and all that stuff and to communicate to retirees. So, so literally, that decision needs to be made you know, sooner rather than later. In, in, the, in the ideal world, you would be getting into that in May, which is next week. So, um, so that, that, that's all I have for today. Um, logistically, and this is really a Pam question. So, um, if we were to process for them, would they still meet with uh, Colonial or whoever doing open enrollment for us? And they would help the retirees to find a plan or how would that work? Probably not. Probably what we would do is we would find a navigator, somebody who is, ex is an expert in helping retirees. So we probably wouldn't be doing the enrollment like we do our normal enrollment for our active employees. We'd probably be consulting with a navigator. Um, those people are have the expertise to help people pick a plan because you got to understand it's really going to be an individual decision. So they'll have to look at what kind of medications the person is taking, what kind of health issues they have, and then help them shop for a plan that's going to fit their particular and what how much money they want to spend with the DDB that we're giving them, and they would do that on an individual basis. So we'd probably hire a navigator, and there are lots of them out there that do that, but that's what we'd be looking at doing. It wouldn't be a normal enrollment profit process. Um, how, how long does this type of changeover take? One year, two years? Well, we would Given be, that you've we would be every, every, doing it um, for January of next year, of 2019, that would be the plan, is to make that change effective with the new plan year. Well, I was kind of looking at the education process for the employees. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's what he was talking about. The earlier you start, the better. So we would start, in, like, in next month, identifying a navigator that we we're going to use and start, you know, having meetings, sending out letters, um, you know, all type of mechanisms to communicate that this change is happening for the retirees. So Eric, is it in this plan that, or something else I read over the weekend where we changed the plan to have 55 retiree, age 55 retiree? And That's one of your options. Yes, it is. So uh, option two and the options for your future hires, all those options, we add additional requirements. Uh, we make them have to work two more years to get the coverage, and we put an age 55 minimum age on it. And I'm, I'm on page 14. So, so, so two and, and 3B both, both have those. In. And conceivably, you know, we could make that an option even if you, with any of these, mm -hmm. yeah. that could be an option. That could be something that we require people to to do for eligibility. Yeah, I guess it's a little closer to the whole rule of 90 and the retirement eligibility is the same. Right now, we, we, we often have to explain to people how they're eligible for retiree insurance, but they're not eligible to retire or vice versa. Because some people, because right now you either have to have 20 years of service. If you were here prior to 20, 2009, and then um, after that you have to have either 25 years or 28 years of service in order to be eligible for retiree insurance. So our, our employees who've been here a long time, they may have 20 years of service, but they may not be old enough or have enough years of service in order to retire. Mm -hmm. Or they have enough years of they have enough years of service and age to retire through the retirement system, but they haven't worked for us long enough to be eligible for our retiree insurance. We get that quite often. Where they say, Well, I'm eligible to retire, and we go, Yeah, but you don't get insurance because you don't haven't worked with the city long enough. So that's that's something we deal with right now. So, so 57. The, the, the first and most important question we have to answer as a council is, are we going to stick with the DDB? Yes, sir. I mean, yeah. That's, that's the driving force. Mm -hmm. Right. Are we going to 
put a a billion dollars worth of liability on the city in a few years, or are we going to stick to it? Right, because we haven't, you know, when, when it, like Eric said, when it was created, the whole concept was that anything that exceeded that, the increases, the retirees would pick up that cost. And it, and it was, it's, it's been a big increase. I mean, we had $3 million in one year increase. When you divide that by 400 people, that's a pretty significant increase. So, so we have not really maintained it and haven't increased it either. We haven't increased the DDB either. And that, that becomes the thing. I mean, the reality is, of course, when it's, it's very personal to you, no one wants to pay more, no one wants changes, but we've got to, I mean, this isn't sustainable. You know, we've got to make a decision and stick to it those costs are just getting higher and higher. Mm -hmm. So our hope is that with this information that we'll be closer to making some decisions about which option you all are going to choose. Of course, um, you know, the, the sooner the better with that. Um, and then we'll have to go through the process of either um, um, doing something formal to solidify the decision that you all have made, and then make the make the steps to move forward um, with either education or whatever the next things that we have to do. So it, it is a. Unfortunately, it is a decision that needs to be make, made sooner than later. Page 16 is, the, is the, probably the easiest page to look at what our decision will result yeah. in. Yeah. I was going to say, are you all going to discuss and make a decision today? I'm ready. I'm not sure. Uh, I'd like us to have some dialogue with the retirees as we promised. Yeah. Yeah. I Time, I, I recognize the time sensitivity. That, that yeah, that was just asking. I'll, I gotta go oh, back for about thirty minutes. Yeah. And I don't I'll think we were thinking y'all would vote here because we don't have vote more sessions, but having a motion made for you as you're, you're stepping out. That doesn't make you count. Yeah. 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 I was actually gonna step out too, but yeah. Yeah. When we both go out, it reverts to you. Oh well, yeah. But yeah, I just wanted to know if, if there was a decision going to be made. I think you ain't got a quorum. <laughs> we do. <laughs> yeah. No, but once you in the rule, once you have a quorum, well, it's only three yeah. quorums. Only three now. We lose we lose we lose, <laughs> we lose a quorum every every time somebody goes to the bathroom too. So it's all right. Yeah. <laughs> but I think the rule. You have a quorum. You establish a quorum. You have because you're not voting. So. Yeah. 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 Um, I just have a status conference. I'll, I'll be right back. But back to the timing issue, some dialogue with retirees and others before we do anything. Right. Well, I think we need to. Decide on approach. Uh, an approach, and then sit down and, and discuss that approach yeah. and why and what the impacts are. I, 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 I don't think you can go in there with a with, with a potpourri of options. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. never get anywhere. You know, I, uh, I I I agree. And Howard, you probably can relate to this. Uh, but I just went through that. Well, and Gina and I just went through this with Nico, boy, my son, because of his disability. Turned 26, we had to uh, see if we could keep him on my insurance as well. Um, it was, we got two letters. One was very vague, and, it's, and Gina freaked out because they, they said, no, he, they disenrolled him. The big old question was, how, what are we going to do? How can we, what can we find out there to match what we already have? Good. And so it just so happened that a standard letter came to us before they actually reviewed his history medically and so forth. Mm -hmm. and, but they, they, they allowed us to maintain him. So I could imagine what some folks are going to have to do if, depending on what we do, it's going to impact them and they've got to 
That's why I'm asking about the time frame mm -hmm. of getting all this stuff done. Mm -hmm. I think uh, we got time. I think we just got to make some decisions. And, you know, yeah. if the post-65 folks have more options than anybody else, they'd be better off having their own mm -hmm. spending account because they can save money mm -hmm. by switching plans. Yeah. And that's been proven. Right. I mean, that, that population, and part of it's the population growth. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. The retirees in Florida outpopulate the state of South Carolina. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, obviously there's a reason why those premiums mm -hmm. are cheaper there. Mm -hmm. Well, that too, and our, our post-65 plan is a blueprint for us. Right, so right, and it always has right. been that way, and that's right. been the problem. Exactly, and it, 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 you know, and every year we've increased our premiums to that population, and honestly they come back and they say, I could get a cheaper plan on my own, and I say, yes, you can, <laughs> and you probably should. But but they don't want to. But I think because it's the experience of the pop of our small population, their health, their you know all their factors. If, if we if we end up having a facilitator help them place mm -hmm. and create that, they'd be mm -hmm. much better off now and in the future. Mm -hmm. They certainly no. would. And, and we're talking about the you know the the four hundred. Our biggest challenge is 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 how do we handle the pre sixty five right population right and do you know. Are you making spousal changes and things like that? And, you know, are we enforcing that if you have an option at another job, you know, you have to take that insurance first and foremost because that's where you're an active employee. Mm -hmm. You know, the, at the cost, you know, is a discussion. You know, some of the retirees, the pre-65, have said, well, I mean, we should, we should maintain our current premium. Well, the current premium, we can't. Right. I mean, it's not sustainable. So... You know, looking at these options, I think we've got, you know, we've got solid options that start at the pre-65, post-65, and then we move all the way down. But I think we're going to have to narrow it down to two that we can come together with and then move forward, and it may be a combination of both. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah but I do think we need to educate to dive into this and make, make some directional decisions. But we also need to make the changes in our retirement if that's an option that that we want to do again that changes you know the eligibility change has to be made for it keeps them on the regular plan until they get to at least 55 so we only have a 10-year window there that's correct you do have that that doesn't make a difference mm -hmm. so we'll, we'll certainly so um, obviously you know we need everybody here to have that discussion so you know, do we want to to push it for the next work session? Because yeah. I don't know if Reverend McDowell is going to make it. He's going to make his plan. So, no, I mean. I know he's talked about having some non-Tuesday meetings as well. Yeah. Which I'm, which I'm wide open for. We can navigate everybody's schedules. But I think for us to get through to make these decisions have a place in plan by January, we need to make a decision in the next 30 days. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Well, I mean, it, there's a whole lot of yes. factors. But Decisions I mean, that y'all make on this will affect every single budget, especially the general fund that we're going to go over later today, mm -hmm. along with the ones we've already seen on water and sewer, stormwater parking. So does it next week, do we meet next week? We do, don't we? <laughs> On May 1st? Uh, we are May 1st. May 1st? That evening, I believe. Is that correct, Erica? You, not gonna I'm not going to be here. Um, and you aren't either. We're going to have a short meeting. See if we can break the record. So that next, that next meeting is oh, the 8th. You can't do that. No, Ms. Wilson will be back next week. So oh, you know, we can't be breaking records. Can we have it on the 30th? <laughs> not on your watch. I, I got to hold my record now. <laughs> So is it the can we the try to, to schedule something early on the eighth? That's a Tuesday, isn't it? Not here, isn't it? Oh, Tamika's not here. What about um? Or what about uh? Later, I mean, what about afternoon of the third? I mean, excuse me, of the second. Is that possible for y'all? Wednesday the seventh. I'm not here. I'm out that all the way till Thursday. But, I mean, I could right. get on the phone if I needed to. I mean, I can. Friday? Friday the 4th. You, you, you want to see what you can negotiate? 
at everybody's calendar. Take a take a look at everybody. You need kind of work on that. And just let's just be flexible when everybody is here. Uh, I am. I think we could set aside mm -hmm. two hours just to work on this. Yeah. On the fifteenth. Yeah. We may want to meet prior to that though as well if we're doing it. Yeah. Um, but I'll, I'll be. I'll be. I, I initially. I, I'm, I'm very flexible on the fifteenth. So we may. We can, we can have a slumber party if you want. Press on. I didn't want to go to that. Getting down to the short rows now. So this All right, the, the brains are here, so that's fine. Let's go. So next step, Erica's going to, we're going to work on we need to look another at meeting. Date. And off Tuesday date, it sounds like. Any more questions for Eric? Thank you. Are good. Thanks for that. You do a good job of explaining a very difficult subject. Eric, a question. Yes, sir. You um, you you up from Atlanta solely for this? Yes, sir. You're not you're not in town anywhere where I could so, maybe solely for you guys. Grab you in a corner somewhere. I, I'll be here through this afternoon, but but if not today. If, if y'all have a time that you want me to come down, I'm, I'm willing to do that. But you, you know. I think everybody else may be okay, but uh, yeah. I'm still trying to um, um, absorb the full impact of this and, and make sure I really understand your models. And Mr. Davis, might, we can meet with you as well, staff. Oh, I know. can you do it? It might be good well, to also have we, we, we yeah, can okay. put him, or, or at least we can have him on speaker if he if he can't travel. We can we can figure out something okay. like that. And we could also include Councilman McDowell. Certainly. Here today, and yeah. I spoke with Miss Wilson this morning. Um, we can include her as well. In our I think conversation. That's good. Okay, that'd yeah. be good. Yeah, I'm here to pleasure. I, I don't. Okay, so you've got since you've got two other people, why don't you check with them and see what their schedule is, and I'll try and work around that. Yeah. We may not need to hook you, but okay. I maybe staff. Yeah, and he can certainly be on on okay. a conference call if we if we need to, because that good. might that might good. have more flexibility with dates. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Our next item will be hospitality tax funding proposal. My, my, my crazy, so let's look at several, sure. several dates. Okay. Uh, maybe work around there. Whichever one. Whichever one you want. I don't care. Just give me some. Mr. Davis, you have Y'all need another copy of the memo? Uh, which memo? The one that was attached to the hospital. I don't see it this morning. It was in the agenda. It was attached. No, I didn't see this. He's not here yet. Everybody's mad with us, so I don't know. They're mad at you, Sam, not me. We've got to figure out a way to, um, to converse with um, Mike Christy. Longo and that. Uh, Mungo, I'm not. They just put an application in like everybody yeah, else. Yeah, they, uh, what's the problem? I don't know what the get is. Over the year, they have many. I had many. This one. They may have your notes. They didn't want to get organized. They didn't want to do all that. They were happy with what Miriam was doing. They want to use it. They want to use it to fix up the place like everybody else is, which comes to a question of 
you know, we need to decide in this hospitality what this tax is going to be used for and what are our, our leeways and, and, and taking the time to look into some of it and what we've been reimbursable. I think we got to, we got to, A, number one, audit our reimbursables. Number two, we need to, to, to make a decision on how this money is spent along with, you know, using the guidelines, but then our own guidelines. Because right now it's the wild, wild west. If you go take a look at what we've been paying and how it's gotten through the system, I don't know. Well, well that's, that's one of the keys to the proposal that I want to talk about this morning. Well, we need, we, 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 we need to look at that because I think we've got two challenges. We've got uh, some newbies in line folks that want to get in line. Then we've got uh, the groups that I'm kind of uh, sensitive toward that have been coming to the table but been leaving basically with nothing. Well, we're funding the same groups over and over and over. Right. Um, let's, let's go with Missy and smaller let's groups start this needed. thing off. Smaller groups need to get a break. Have a, uh, discussion. All right, well, the... Okay. The... First section we really wanted to do to help you get started and warmed up on this conversation is talk a little bit about what the city's existing program or existing grant um, program is. And so there are three methods right now for funding hospitality tax grants. Um, regardless of any allocation made, whether it's for city purposes or external or agency use, those funds must meet um, state law and you and public use. So we're trying to make sure we cover those bases as well. The first section is called is referred to as council funded line items. Line items are those are those agencies that um, they still submit an application. However, they are not reviewed by the hospitality tax committee, um, and they are still also reviewed by um, at this point now. Um, DD um, reviews them out of the out of the grants office. Um, allocations typically are flat from one year to the next. There have been some fluctuations um, over the past several years, whether it's for a specific specific project or something. Um, but typically, those those line items stay stay the same for for multiple years. The biggest thing about line item agencies, and the reason why there were line item agencies from the beginning, is that these groups had a specific tie to the city. Um, whether it is through the fact that they are in a city-owned building, such as with Adventure and Columbia Museum of Art. Um, they have a contract or upkeep of the building, such as Historic Columbia, who operates, the city owns the um, historic homes, they own the inter interiors, and also the city has a, a, a contractual agreement for operation and maintenance of those facilities. There's a statutory relationship, such as the Columbia Music Festival Association. Um, and then there's a city-sponsored outreach or community arrangement, such as um, Famously Hot. There have been some groups added that, um, I think one or two groups that have been added that aren't necessarily tied to one of those things, um, but that's been in some recent years um, that that's occurred. The next group is actually the Hospitality Tax Committee and how they make their recommendations. Um, I'm, a, I'm not going to go into that too much. Dee Dee's going to come up and talk about that, the hospitality tax application process and the committee process a little more in detail. The newest section is council allocations. In recent years, especially in light of having some significant fund balance and available savings, city council has made direct allocations for specific use. Typically, those have not come through any kind of Grant application process or review process, requests that we made in council has considered that allocation. Of course, as surplus, as you are aware of, has dried up pretty significantly with regards to having an excess surplus. We do typically end the year with some surplus because revenues have come in a little more aggressive than what we projected, although um, our projections, we have gotten more aggressive in our budget projections. Um, and then also, too, there are some some agencies that either don't submit the required um, request to carry forward. City Council many years ago allowed for that if a group doesn't spend their money in the first year, they are allowed to carry it forward for one year. They have to make that request in writing by May 30th. If they don't, those funds are forfeited. So occasionally there are some funds that are forfeited either because they didn't request it or because they've extended their, they've gone their past their full two years of the allocation. 
And that's true for any of our grant programs also, like when there are funds for community promotions as well. The other important item to add is that these funds are not typically treated as re reoccurring like it is with some of the line item agencies. Those are reoccurring allocations. These groups, it's a one-time hit, although I think there has been some confusion in the past over those allocations in the sense that they are reoccurring or that they somehow will be um, renewed again for the next year at the same amounts. Um, it is completely dependent upon there being surplus funds, or as we've discussed in the city in the budget preparations, as we give to you the amounts available for hospitality tax, we divvy it up the the three pots based on what has been done in the past. Of course, before we pass the budget or before you pass the budget, city council wants to change how those how these how the how the process which we're talking about today, then it's subject to you know those changes as well. So that's what that process is for the, um, the three main groups. Of course, there is a transfer to the general fund that's not listed here. And then there's also debt service payments, which, of course, are oblig obligated. So those have to be made as well. The transfer to the general fund is based upon there being expenses that the general fund performs that are equivalent or that are eligible for hospitality tax. Mostly police. Pardon? Mostly police. Actually, mostly public works and, par and parks and recreation. Police supportingly. Right, supportingly. On that same note, we'll talk a little bit about what state law is with regards to state um, with hospitality tax. I'm sure you all are very familiar with hospitality tax state code. Um, of course, it's related to tourism related building in buildings, including but not limited to civic centers, coliseums, and aquarium, tourism related cultural, recreational, or historic facilities, beach access and renourishment. Don't we have any of those unless we count the shores of Lake Murray? Um, highways, roads, streets, and bridges providing access to tourist destination, which is where public works comes into play. Advertisement and promotions related to tourism and recreate uh, de tourism development, or water and sewer infrastructure to serve tourism-related demand. We have not utilized that function, um, although certainly there are opportunities for that as well. The next section refers to how we can also utilize funds for police, fire, emergency medical, and emergency preparedness that are directly in attendance to those tourism-related facilities. So that's an additional allocation. So the eligible expenses, well, so if you look at the state code, I mean, obviously, is there more detail to it? So That's the bulk of it. I mean, it's pretty verbatim so from I the state the code. Question. This is the actual code here. So the question to you know to me is as we get into this discussion is is what's qualified as reimbursable expense? Sure. You know, State or, code does not say anything about reimbursable expense. That's a, a internal accounting function that our auditors have to sign off on. And well, there has to be eligible expenses. Yeah, correct. The, 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 so it what has is to be eligible according to the things so that what's it can be spent on? So what's eligible? What what's the? I guess it's a gray area, and we need to define that. Is no. that where I think we are? Because, you know, to me, where I struggle is is doing an audit and looking at at several groups paperwork. The reimbursables. I mean, we're paying for Mountain Dew and and water and cups and things, toilet paper. For their employees, which I don't think is reimbursable, I don't think that was the intent of the money. I don't think gift cards are intent. I don't think flower bed liners may or may not be intent. I don't know. I mean, these are questions we need to define. I mean, what are we paying for? Um, and and I think each group, and especially when we're talking about the the hospitality areas, have different. You know. The bid in, on Main Street was created to run block by block. Well, now we're paying 100% of that block by block. And, and looking at those expenses in there, I question them. I'm very concerned why staff, it, how, how they got signed off on. I mean, making a, you know, late payments and others. And these are all things that are in our records that are right there in front of us. And so... As we're going for a change, I think, one, we need to audit. Two, I think we need to have some strict and specific guidelines. And if we're looking to fund a group as, as, as a line item, I think it's got to be very specific on what that money can be used for. Because right now, to me, it looks like it's a little of the wild, wild west out there. That we are, we are not, I don't know if it's 
on both ends or the relationships have just gotten so well that we just sign off on everything? I don't know the answer. But when you look at something and you see a receipt for $1,400 for gift cards from Publix, you got to go, whoa, time out. What is that for? Yeah. The, well, sta uh, the state law gives you the uses of the local hospitality taxes. And what I would like to do is get off of the thing of looking at the receipts. If we say that a, an event is, is eligible that, uh, and it is an event that is bringing tourists into the city to spend more H tax and it's going to cost $100,000, then we sign a contract with the recipient of that money and say, we're going to give you $100,000 and I would like to give it quarterly and not get into the business of looking whether they bought Mountain Dews or Linas for things. You, we sign every council meeting. We go through a consent agenda that spends millions of dollars on contracts, and we don't make these contractors bring in receipts for gas and lines. That's because it, but, yes, they do. Yeah, yeah, we do. Have you have you gone go go in that office right there and go look at what we what we make? Uh, Bo Autry, not Bo Autry. What's his name? Hughes. Go through. I, I went through those those. Receipts. It is very specific. He's spending it, getting reimbursed, and it is a line item. I mean, detailed. And some of those bills, things aren't eligible. We aren't doing that. We need to know where that money goes. And what's the? If we do this, what is the um, requirement, or what's the penalty if if they misspend the money? Well, we we claw we, it back, and we don't fund them again. But we we are where we are now because I think. Along the way, we tried to make a decision to to not have to get into the weeds on certain items, right. so we got flexible. But um, if if we're going to do that, Daniel, then I think we need to agree on or, or staff what what is an acceptable expenditure and what is not. Well, that's what I think. We, if we're going to overhaul the system, I think we need to be specific because we're getting to a point now where we're going to spend all the hospitality money on clean and safety, and that was not its original intent. I think it, part of it, I think it makes sense for for areas, um, but at the same time, you know, and, and I'm I'm going to pick on City Center Partnership today because, you know, we created a bid to create a block by block system. But now we're funding three hundred thousand dollars a year of hospitality towards that. I don't think that was the intent. That hospitality money should be for marketing and their their collection. The people are paying a tax, and a tax to cover that cleaning, and it's that's not what's being used. And I don't think some of the money's being spent correctly. And I don't think it's you know. I, and then we I think we need to look at what these agencies have in their portfolio. If somebody's got, you know, seven, eight, nine hundred thousand dollars, why are we giving them additional funding? Well, I agree with you. That I mean, I think we need to know what what they pay their the employees. I mean, because I think that all depends on the on the cost. I mean, we're supposed to be helping multiple hospitality money is not just for five groups. It's supposed to help grow our arts in return. And there's some groups that, that have a huge economic impact. I just don't think we've given people a clear line of how that money should be spent. And I'm all for looking at it, doing a different system, but I want specific guidelines. I want to know what the return is. Okay. I just don't think it, I don't think you can just write a check to somebody and say, oh, we, you know, we're going to give you a hundred and let's hope you do everything okay. I just don't think that's the way you do it. But it doesn't mean you can't do it, but if a group doesn't want to accept the guidelines, then they don't need our money. Well, what the guidelines would be, you, you perform what you say you're going to perform. If you're going to put on Arts of Vista or, or any event, then we, we think that this is worth uh, $200,000 from the city of Columbia. You do that. But we don't need to go behind them and say, well, you can buy light bulbs, but you can't buy the, pay the electric bill. Or you can put a... Uh, Hospitality money's not a, supposed to pay for that kind of stuff anyway, Right. 
operation and maintenance of all these things that are funded by that? So you're okay with us buying drinks and paying late payments and gift cards and all that kind of stuff? I'm, I'm okay with us funding a particular project at a certain amount and letting them do it. Well, let me ask this. I, I, I think like in, you know, as in other uh, businesses we, we do, we do determine what is ex what is an acceptable expenditure and what is not. Well, how are you gonna make a list of everything that's acceptable? Well, I think you, you can have a guideline, uh, but I mean, if if I'm sitting here and so, is it okay for hospitality group? To, so if I'm ex ballet, it's okay for me to buy an ad from another ballet thing. And just shifting money back and forth. I don't think that was the intent. And I don't think they should be able to do it. Right. That. But I don't think it's just like I mean, you think it's okay that we're we buy gift cards with hospitality money? I don't know what the gift cards were used for, but well, it, what it, was the event that we were funding? Huh? It, operations. There was no event in it. That's the thing. That's what I'm saying is is we're not we're we're funding with an open with no guideline in it. That to me is what makes me nervous. And then we've got groups, you know, look, I have to get reimbursed for any travel expense or anything. I have to fill out forms. I mean, that's standard operating procedure for every business in America. Why should we just blank check it? Didn't we, uh, hospitality was audited. Yeah, and, uh, we did one two years ago. And, and we, periodically, we our external auditor also pulls things out. So it's his call as to when he does it and what he and where he will go. Is that right? Or do we point him in a certain direction? We do have a new internal auditor that could... So we, we have an internal... Our, ex, our external auditor audits to what we say we're going to do. He took the guidelines and documentation that we had on our website and when he did the audit, he audited to that. That's where he found some expenses that were ineligible. And he's only going to audit to what we say is our policy. Right. He's not going to make our policy. Right. And that's what's up here was to talk about, in addition to state policy, state code, the other guidelines in terms of what so is exactly what we're talking we, about. So to do what, what you want to do, how do we do the two things that need to happen. One is establish guidelines. You know, an event is an event, and then there's there's operations, and that's where I think the line is not being well, clear. What, what would trigger an audit? We, we, we would have the right to audit any of these events that we... Well, yes, yeah, but, yeah, but, but I'm, we not, have, I'm not saying do it just because we have the right to do it. I'm saying there should be certain triggers that we... But if we don't give people guidelines, how are you going to say it? How are you going to say it? City guidelines are that you have a financial statement, you have a current 990. Which not, which I don't think, but one out of the six that I pulled are current. And we, and we, we still write checks to them. And we do, we need to tighten that up. But if you have a financial, if you have a 990, if you have a clear plan of what they're going to perform for their money that this, they're going to get out of the eight stacks, I don't think we need to get into the weeds to look at whether they're buying plant liners or Coca-Colas or what. They're, perform they're using the money to put on an event or some something that's going to bring tourists, and we define tourists as people from outside of the city limits, inside the city limits. And we don't need to make these organizations continually save every dollar's worth of gas that they buy. But Howard, if, if if you owned your own business and your employees came to you and just said, just you know, just give me an allowance, you know, and I'll just spend it however you want, you're not your accountant's not going to go for that. Well, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that. But that's what that, you just said. No, I am saying that we would have a contract that would say for X amount of dollars you're going to perform this, and that's where we would stipulate what what event or operation they would do with the hospitality tax money. Okay, I, I think we could uh, and probably should kind of um, come to some kind of a, an agreement on what is what is auditable and what is not. Or what we 
I think we have to decide what is an eligible expense okay, and what's right. not, and then they need to craft their budget on the event around that. We, I think we can do that, but you know, my, my overall concern over the years, even this morning, has been um, how do we uh, spread more of those dollars around? And that's what I was proposing a group three that would be the innovative groups, that the new groups that would would get a certain percentage of the tax. I don't, I, I don't, I don't have a problem with that. But then we go back to um, the question of uh, what is ac an acceptable expense and what is not. Because um, that makes a difference in funding and what's available. Yeah. And, and, and that and that charge, are you talking about that charge being to the the, high, the committee, like the committee would have to preserve out 10, 20, 30 percent of the of their allocation to these specific groups. Well, I won't. I wouldn't say ten, twenty, or thirty percent, but some, some percentage. We, we would establish a pot of money that would be used for the third group, which would be the small groups that are new, that are innovative, uh, and they would receive funding uh, because of of their new status. Yeah, and then I I don't know that we've been consistent with with uh, again what is allowable and what is not. The question, for example, of. Uh, um, administrative expenses. Um, you can use it for operation and maintenance of any of the things that are listed. What about salaries? Or a portion of, of an exact salary? For, for, for salaries. You no, can okay. use it for, certainly use it for police and fire and right. operation. If, if, we, if we funded NOMA and they, they had a contract to bring, to provide uh, a festival and mm -hmm. Promotion and a mm -hmm. website. I think that we could give them hospitality tax and a portion they could, can they go could towards use, salary. And portion of it could go towards salaries. Okay. I think that's some of those are the questions that fall not just under the state hospitality tax, but also public use. Yes. That was one of the issues that we ran into with one of the other agencies that's now split their their yeah. allocation. So. What? What was the issue? Public funds have to be used for public use, so you'd have to be yeah. careful. Funding of salaries, and then also, to funding of organizations that this is their sole source of funding. Well, and it's not in my proposal book. Uh, when you talk to Ms. Reese, who's the consultant from Texas that's helping the cultural plan, she says that we should not fund more than 50% of the cost of salaries. Any, any event. So, if so how do you do that with a contract? You find out how much that the, the event was be. I, I don't have that in my proposal. You you would find out how much their budget was by their 990, and then you would say we can't go over X dollars. At least for I existing would, groups or yeah. existing festivals. I would yeah. think that with, with a number of them, we've exceeded that. Yeah, I'm sure that's, something, that, that's, that's not in my proposal, but right. that's something that Margie Something for about. discussion. I don't have a problem with that. I think we I think we're funding some of the groups too, too uh, much. Well, if we were to uh, discuss that and, and agree to adopt that approach, yeah. we'd, we'd spread the dollars a, a little further. Yeah, yeah. We'd have more dollars. It also probably gets to sustainability too with the organization and the event. Yeah, I think the theory was that they would be matching the dollars that the city provides. If you're going to have a hundred thousand dollar event. The city ought not give more than fifty thousand, and they would have to raise the other fifty thousand to make them sustain. I don't know if you want to go over it, but we do have what the guidelines are that the city has, as well as um, that's our you know our guidelines. Didi's prepared to, co to discuss that piece, and then the, also um, the committee process, and then also um, the reimbursement process. If you want to discuss that. I think we're kind of spinning our wheels of discussing I would. three people here. At least two of them at odds. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't I, don't, I, I don't think we're at odds. What I think we is is that to establish your proposal, we, we need to have stronger guidelines. The PowerPoint we gave you does how, summarize the process. I don't know if you want to ask Didi any questions about the process or go over the process? Yeah, it's, it's in her PowerPoint plan. Starting on slide page, page six. Five. Yeah. 
Oh, okay. Yeah. So basically, I would have three three groups. The larger group, not only would they get uh, have contracts, but they would get a two year commitment, and we would true that up every year. So the way to do multiple year budgets uh, is you, end of the first year you would they would be getting some, but you would true up the amount going into the second year, and so you'd always have two years going uh, on a contract. So groups. Uh, like the Nickelodeon that have to make commitments into the next year won't have to wait until June or July to find out how much money they're going to have for, for the for the next year. They would they would know that they would have some funding. Thank you. Um, Thank you. The other thing that I think would would be good is the Group Four, which would be capital projects group. We've got about four to five hundred thousand dollars that's rotating around out there now. And I think we ought to be able to keep that um, money and and plug in different groups to use that money for capital expenses. I know there are two or three groups out there now that are asking us for capital funds, and we need a system to evaluate and put them in line to use that four or five hundred thousand dollars as it rolls back into our avail uh, useful availability. Right now, all of our capital uh, contributions to, to, to the groups that receive hospitality dollars are hospitality dollars, not, they're, they're not, hospitality, not city, not they're city hospitality money. dollars. And so we could keep that pot of hospitality dollars and set, set up a line of groups that we will approve that as these monies have become available, then they get in line to use it for another capital. We got, we got Town Theater coming in. We've got uh, Trustus Theater that, that that's looking for funds. Uh, Again. I'm sure there are others out there. Uh, the Historic Columbia is looking for, for some funds for repair of some of the cottages that we own. Uh, all of that could come out of that $500,000. We just actually that it. money could come from liquor rebate because it's historic. You wouldn't have to you wouldn't have to go to hospitality. We're about I think some of our historic. challenges on that has been that it actually has to also be capital. And their contract covers what they would pay for repairs. Well, that, that I don't I don't have a problem with that. Um, the high, the uh, liquor rebate dollars it comes and goes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, it's um, a small part. It's a small part. They're not um, drinking enough down in five Well, that's because somebody wants to close them. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> ding 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 ding. All right. Um, but that that is something I I think we ought to. Uh, collectively always take a look at because uh, if we I didn't know it was there for a while and it had built up and we were able to use some of that to do two things to move that Monteith school, school to the other side of the street and help shore it up and uh, you know so. and the CMA huh? we, John got some to, yeah and we owe him yeah. another okay. that that another. I think is a a perfect example of how you can use those funds That's right. from time to time. Of course, folks would have to get in line for that one for sure. That's right. We would plan that out multiple years so that people would know that we're going to have available in the next year 200,000. So. Well, I mean, well, te but te technically, you know, I, I get the two year, but I don't think any group that's in that category has seen a significant decline in their funding over the last 10 years. And then two now, not I one of them. But then they, they, they actually—they don't know that it's going to be there until July one. You know, the, I guess the other question is: is how many groups are you talking about that receive fifty thousand dollars or more? Well, if if we can get an agreement that this is something that we want to consider, then I think Ginger and I and the Arts Committee can work on coming up with that list. I didn't want to show y'all a list today of proposals because. How many? Well, how many? How many people are we talking about? How many groups? Yeah, uh, probably twenty or thirty in the fifty thousand range. Yeah. Here comes the legal deal. Legal will say it's not necessary. Uh -oh. This is not a legal decision. This is a finance decision. How many? 
We have, may have a few more than that. I'm trying to run through and count now. Um, and that, and that number I put in there was $50,000. That's correct. I was trying to get in that. Say what now? We're out. Would be, it would be 20 or 30. So, so, and, and, and that is out of how many groups that receive hospitality money? Between 80 and okay. 90. So 30 percent. Okay. 30 percent of $50,000. And I would $50, have them still go to the committee uh, to make sure that they've still got eligible projects, and they're still doing things that are acceptable under the state law. Mm. That's it. So just to understand the the theory behind it if you use Marjorie's thing then so if you're currently giving somebody three hundred thousand dollars for a certain project you're talking about only giving them a hundred and fifty thousand well that's not part of my proposal no I thought uh, that's what you just said I, I said that's what she says I haven't gotten on that for you because that, that would be a big step She says, she says that the norm for these type funds is to not fund more than half of the cost of the event, whatever you sponsor or service. It's my because duty. it's like they're matching our contribution, the hospitality tax contribution. But I haven't got gone there because that's going to be a major change. She's talking about Margie's recommendations to you. When, when she and I have had several conversations. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's that's part of our conversation, but it's not my part of my proposal I'm putting on the table because I think that's a big step, and that's going. What where have where a hard is the hard time getting the contracts approved? The the goods and services that comply with age tax guidelines. Usually, uh, it's for for most of the groups. It's for advertising and marketing for the age tax. Um, everything listed security. Um, a portion of the salary if it's for the media and advertising things like that there's only the small percentage that fell into and it's for things like clean and safe where you have to decide how does that fall into the state guidelines of fitting bringing so in, the tourists in and clean and safe so the that in, that means the labor and the service does that mean all the ancillary costs around it too we would need we would need to be more specific on those. It's how we determine, or how council has determined them in the past, or staff has determined them in the past to fit that. So it's how you determine it for the operations for clean and safe that are bringing the tourists in, or things you were talking about, the flower beds, things like that. Is that included as operations, or is it not? We need to have more clear guidelines on what would be acceptable and not acceptable. And my point is, we don't need to get into those weeds, literally, in the flower beds. But, but, but Howard, <laughs> Howard, Howard, let's, let's be honest. So, penny sales tax, great example. The public, this is public money. This isn't some private in the money. This is public money. Bought drinks and stuff for their administration. That's not an acceptable reimbursement, but it was being paid. Now the county's having to pay it back. We've got organizations that are charging us for their employees' snacks and stuff. That is not an eligible expense. Gift cards are not an eligible expense. You remember last time we had a gift card guy, we had to get rid of him because he was cashing them in and using them himself. Um, that's my concern is, is having a clear. It's... it's and to say it's a burden, you're getting funding. You are getting funding. And the mission has changed. We've allowed it to change. It's council's needs to get back and reestablish how the funding's used. I don't think a, a change in the way we do it's a problem. I think we need to be very specific about it, though. And that's my concern is, is that I'm sitting here going, I started to audit to look into it and understanding where people are spending their money, you know, the organization's missions have changed. 
you know, I didn't vote for the extra 50000 for clean and safety because Cindy Center Partnership doesn't need it. You know, but when they started the bid, the bid was to, to, to do this block by block. Now it's suddenly shifted all to hospitality money. And now we're going to have, and, and all of this is going to change as Harvest and puts in their request, because that's what they want. So we're going to have everything clean and safety, which does have a role in tourism. There's no doubt about that. I, I agree with that. But at the same time, what are we going to be left with? If every group has clean and safety funded out of here in the service, we're not having any money to grow the arts program. And that's part of the, the tourism. You know, we're getting away from marketing and using money clearly a lot more for services, which, you know, some of it, I don't, I don't know what happened to the sense of pride, but everybody expects everybody else to clean up after them today. And, you know, I do think that's an issue. You got well, an amen back here. I, now the shrieking or amening? Uh, uh, well, I mean, I just, you know, Mr. Mayor, I just, you know, I, I, I just did a self audit, and I was just very shocked at what we've reimbursed, and it, and it, and and it worries me on the long term of the hospitality, and that if we're gonna make a change, which I think is is probably mm -hmm. warranted where we are, I, I agree with that. I just think we need to be more specific, but I don't believe that it should be left wide open without, you know. Well, a couple of core thoughts. Um, one is I think that every few years you've got to go back and look at the way you're doing things and, and reevaluate them. I think that's just smart. Things change. Um, priorities change. Mm. Uh, uh, practices shift. And you got to come back and kind of got to rearrest the process and, and, uh, and make sure that things are, are, are going consistent with whatever the policy of the city is consistent with what state and, and laws and our, our local ordinances. Um, secondly, um, I've, I've always been very clear about my belief that the funding priorities uh, and the responsibility uh, attached to them are that of this council. Um, we, we're, uh, we're blessed to have a great group of citizens who, who do a whole lot of blocking and tackling for us. Otherwise, I'm not sure we'd be able to do anything else. To be honest with you, I think we could spend an entire um, year uh, going through H tax applications, we don't have to do that because they have some good, great folks, and we we tend to tinker around the edges um, here, or there, and make some adjustments. But the but the vast majority of the work is being done by a group of, of citizen servants, and, and I think that's great, a great thing. We need to keep that happening, with full recognition of the fact that the uh, not only the authority but the responsibility to make those decisions rests with this council, with, with no one else. Um, I like the idea of streamlining. To some degree, uh, as long as it's consistent with with with, with a established set of, 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 of with some clarity and some and some accountability and and, and, and some auditing, um, I, I do love the idea of, of making sure that new and, and fledgling groups uh, uh, from different parts of the city have an opportunity to participate in, in this process. I think that's got to be built in here uh, in, in some way, and I'm excited about participating to amplify and the the uh, incredible experience that Marjorie Reese uh, is, is bringing. Uh, to our region uh, through one one Columbia, so um, I, I mean I'd, I'd love to uh, digest this a little bit more. Sure, um, Howard, uh, but but I, but you're right. We, we've got to continue to police the process in the way in which we, we're making sure that we're everyone's following the same rules, that we're extracting um, value, and that we, we're taking a close look at everybody's 990 and, and, and seeing exactly how, how strong they are, how strong the balance sheets are, and if we have to. Reallocate resources accordingly. We, we can we can do so. All right. So I don't know no specifics on this today, other than we're going to come back and and further discuss it. Um, I think we ought to develop some guidelines to go with it. I think we need to know. You know, I do think the fifty years, fifty thousand. I mean, that, you're talking about twenty five to thirty groups. Getting that much or that or less. Oh, I'm getting in that range. Fifty thousand is a magic. Well, you want to go up or down? I'd rather go up. The original proposal actually came from Andy Smith, and he said which it should be a hundred thousand. But I brought it down to be able to get mm. smaller groups in 
That's the only way we can spread it around. That's right. So that's why I brought it down to, to 50. Yeah. Okay. I, I think we, have, we, have, we should do that. The number is flu fluid there. I mm -hmm. mean, yeah. Okay. Um, you know, I met with. And, uh, and let, so, let me, so, go ahead. Let me say this before we shut this down. Um, as part of the uh, the forums we've been having with, with uh, one Columbia and the artists around the city, right. I've sat in on about three of those groups, and the the one thing that has been constant in the conversations with the artists, I'm not talking about organizations, artists, individual artists, is that. Um, they don't seem to feel that they can ever get a seat at the table. Hell, they need to start paying their business license yeah. first, oh. then they get a seat at the table. Then that fine. <laughs> I'm just saying, there's a there. There are some people out there who I like think Mr. Rickham is. Uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> they, they 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 share the same feelings I have, and the question is, how do they get? To, remember, artists are the poorest folks well, they, in the professional find. field. They've got to find a hook that will let right. the H but that I'm, I'm just saying, I, I, I'm towards. hoping that as we go through all of this, we figure out a way uh, that uh, an individual artist who may be participating in some of these festivals or whatever mm -hmm. can can uh, get some assistance to help them. That ought to come the through the sort of festival of, itself. The ability, the ability, the ability maybe, to, maybe not. No, Sam, I think you're. I think I think you. I think I think you're uh, exactly right. The ability to do uh, tightly structured micro grants that, that don't come with a, a whole lot of uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, mm -hmm. administrative processes, mm -hmm. but but with some significant accountability, I think is a, is a is a pretty good idea. It obviously, it has to be tied into what 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 the resources are supposed to be going to, but. Mm -hmm. But you'd be amazed at five hundred dollar, a thousand dollar. Needs to be five hundred or less. Yeah, but but that but it, but it could be it could be significant to some of these upset upset artists. Uh, I do think I got well, my I got my start in, yeah. in uh, mm -hmm. artist blacksmithing mm -hmm. with a two thousand four hundred dollar grant mm -hmm. from the Arts Commission uh, 15, 20, 20 years ago. That's how I got my start. The best way to make it make one of those micro grants work is that you make it a pool and they pay back in it over a period of time and if you look at you know when when I was in Egypt that was one of the, the greatest things to see is this USA grants that we did all these micro grants for females to be able to start their own business and right. they were small amounts and they paid it back but they had the ability to go back so they could expand their business and the impact it had was mm -hmm. great um, and we uh, that makes sense in uh, Specific areas that are targeted for redevelopment. Also, the small, the small businesses, mom and not really mom and pops in the old sense, could, could use also when you've got big development coming. But what about some of the smaller businesses that want to kind of you know pop up in on some of these corridors or side streets? Does it make sense for it, this to go to the committee? To come up with a set of guidelines to bring back the council, because I think we 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 we're to, if we're if we're at a moment of change, then we need to be looking at you know status of the organizations that are receiving money, you know financially how stable they are, because you know, you remember when this all came about, it was supposed to be at a certain point people came off of the hospitality because we built them up and, and their stature was grown, we seem to just continue to keep funding them more. You know, and, and I think, you know, every year we hear from certain groups, well, we're going to shut our doors if y'all don't fund us. Well, maybe their time has come and gone if that's the case. But I know two events that have happened this year that swore to us that they didn't get additional funding, and they probably had their best year they've ever had. So, you know, at a certain point, you know, how do we continue to spread? And you know, may, maybe this is is there's maybe a little weaning in it. I don't know, but I do think that we need to start taking more accountability because when organizations started, when you get to a certain level where you know you're financially sound, then maybe we ought to be weaning back. And what was your original intent too? Have you changed your mission? 
from when we first funded you. I mean, I think this is a perfect time to, to put that. But I think just blanketing, writing a check to somebody without some guidelines, I just, I, I think we're, we're creating a, a mess. So we, we're going to definitely need feedback from the uh, committee as to how we do this. And I think it all come, particularly how this group one, not only uh, um, someone agreeing to allow the city to perform, to perform an audit, I think we need to go ahead and plan for and budget for some random audits as well, a handful of random as a regular, regular duty of ours. Um, currently, the committee, you were talking about the sustainability, that is one of the questions in the application, so that is one of the things that they consider. Um, so they do consider many of the things you're talking about already when they go through and consider these groups. Um, keeping in mind to be diverse and get the money in the neighborhoods and things like that as well. Um, but and the guidelines themselves, like I said, most of them are security, advertising, marketing, the things that we that are definitely eligible, and those are um, audited internally as far as just you know through what we process, making sure that those are eligible, and then accounting does that as well. But there are those few that um, well, when it comes under operations where we need some definite. We need some more guidelines. So maybe would it make sense to have? Some folks from the hospitality committee, the H tax committee, and and the arts, the council committee, come together and try to put something together. I mean, I I think that would make a lot of sense. Who's on the arts committee for the council? Is that do you know the council members that are on that? Is it Mr. Mc, is it McDowell? Well, it's no, um, it's our preservation. I see. The city's council arts. It was it was chaired by Mr. Bedura. Um, I'm not sure who stood in for Mr. Bedura. Y'all been meeting chair, a lot chair, lately. Chair. <laughs> 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 it's been a while. Well, I would sure. suggest that you know Howard's brought a proposal that he sit in on the committee, so that yeah. you've got three mm -hmm. members mm -hmm. representing council. And we get a group out of yeah. the uh, I grab a couple of those folks. I would I would suggest we do that sooner than later. Okay. Um, and use use your proposal as the basis, and then yeah. get into the detail. Okay. Uh, John, this John, is part John, John. proposal too, because he he sent this proposal to the mayor several years back. Essentially. Mayor trashed it. All right, we'll put that together and work at it again. <laughs> Just for logistical purposes, is part of the changes expected to be made for this upcoming funding cycle starting July 1? Because I think the committee the committee yeah, meets to review applications. Bad. Well, I mean, I, I think that, that, shouldn't, that shouldn't change what the committee does, yeah. what it's going to yeah. do is when it comes to, it's going to tighten up what yeah. the expenses are yeah, you're not, you're and, not and the guidelines mm -hmm. around it. I mean, that shouldn't change requests or or yeah, anything else, I don't okay. think. Okay. It just may be what they don't get reimbursed. And then I guess the other part, too, is I'm not clear on whether or not some of these, if, if it works out that there's additional allocations made for these certain categories, is that the committee that is making those fundings per those categories? Because obviously city council I think, I think, I think can establish let the, let the, let the direction. Continue to do the work. Let this be advisory for, let's prepare for the next next budget cycle. I mean, I mean let them it, operate. If we, can, if we can find something that uh, is got the right guidelines from Mr. Rickerman, if we could get it in starting in Look, y'all can vote around me. I'm just telling you that, that I think there needs to be specific guidelines. And I think, unfortunately, by just spending a little time going through the reimbursables, it really opened my eyes that we, we, are, we have not done our due diligence. Well, well, let, that, let, that be, let that be an advisory on the reimbursables. I mean, first, let's, let's, I, think, I think you can bifurcate this discussion. If we're going to change the, the overall process, let that be perspective. Let the process go through as is. I, I just think we got more than enough to say grace over and not enough time. That's just, that's I, just my. Yeah, I think that's, that's my that's my opinion. Uh, or, or maybe maybe we could we could tweak because I, I I want us to uh, kind of really come to some kind of agreement on that one question, the question of whether or not uh, the dollars can be spent 
on administrative costs such as participating in the executive director's salary. Now, I, it's happening out there, but there's an understood rule that that can't be done. It can be done. Well, I, I'll... If our rules prevented it, it can't be done, but I think it can be done. Okay, I, for example... Uh, um, I think it can be done, but if, if people have the assets from I, other resources, yeah, then they shouldn't I, be using our money I, I, no, for that. I understand I that. that. I'm, that, I'm that talking a, about it here again, an organization that's trying to get to where they should be yeah. after so many years. Well, if you, if you go and with reimbursement... They've always reimbursement. been denied, I think, the salary for the executive director. That's the NCBA. No, I, don't, you know. I, don't, I don't think... I think they've been able to do that as a portional. You can't do 100% of it. No, no, but I'm not. proportionally for the work you do. So if you run all the advertising, then you can bill right. but we, for a we portion to, of that. Uh, that's something I'm going to encourage them to do this year because they haven't, you know, uh, they're, um, they're last in line when it comes to that. It is a legitimate expense, but it's just been some confusion as to whether or not it's allowable. If we continue on reimbursable, then you automatically are eliminating some of the smaller groups that don't have the wherewithal mm -hmm. to front the money. Right. I understand. Okay. So. Yeah, but we're but I, I don't know if I agree with that statement, Howard. Because if you're if you're planning for an event, unless it's happening before your your money, I mean you can you can float that money. I mean we're we've been I don't know any event that has not been held because of us on not money. Even money. Is that can anybody name one? Well, you might have ones that could have done an event, but they don't have the resources to get the event done to ask the city for a reimbursement. Well, then then maybe they shouldn't be doing the event, well, right? Well, the Sam's thing of the new, new innovative groups that might be out there that but, could help us. But at the same time, just if you just take what Marjorie's talking about, you wouldn't you wouldn't fall in that category. And Prudence says you don't build an event if you don't have any money to get the event going. Mm. I mean, that, I mean, that's... So that would be an organization that's uh, basically living solely on what we're giving. Right. On the front end. And if they're living solely on what we're giving, that's, that wasn't the intent of hospitality either. Never was. Never has been. So who's calling the meeting? So the committee is, is actually uh, Mr. Badura, Mr. Duval, and Mr. McDowell. So, and Mr. Uh, but Dura's absence, do you mind uh, serving? I'll sit in. Okay. Sit in. When Dow Davis and Duval. Yeah. So same committee, just just different. Okay. Different. We got there a different way. <laughs> okay. Who's calling it? Erica. Oh. Erica. Okay. Okay. Do we need to take a? break before we delve into the next topic. But what I think we should do is do the proper Some thing. Is places may provide us with services, but all of them. I think part of it's our fault. So, so we can't do the whole contract thing. That's just a natural migration. Okay, you probably decide. Yeah, we need to go back and get a little off code. Correct. Five years later, we got to come back again. It's gonna, it's gonna be an evolving process. I want to make sure you got a balance sheet. Um, we ought to be able to spread these resources a lot more fairly. I, I need to write it down. So I can the you got to say, you know, like say you've been on the city center part. I struggle a little bit right now when I look at it. Service or? It is created. 
to collect the taxes that people pay for it. Yeah. 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 That's why that people down. So you say But I just pulled random things to look at. So I took like the first reimbursement quarter and just went through it. So, so have we created this huh? expectation? Yeah. Sidebar, you, are you, are you speaking of the smart cities? Well, I, I had lunch yesterday in New York with uh, uh, folks from Carlisle. And Jennifer Gold was talking about you. Jennifer Gold, she works, she's one of the partners in Carlisle. Yeah, yeah. I was asking them for $10 million for the museum, <laughs> the, the, the uh, Metal Bottom Museum. Good morning. Yeah, what doing? Help us get it. Well, we went up to meet all the, the hedge funds and yeah, spent two days. But she said something to me. She goes, Well, you know, the mayor from Columbia. I said, Well, you know, I serve with the mayor. And she's like, Well, you should come up to the smart city. Come up. Come up, my man. I'm up there the whole time. But my man is. And I think I'll be there in the main head tonight. And I'm just going to squeak it. Yeah. Well, the, the players that are. A friend of mine, an organizer. Already and she's pulled together a really, really strong list. It's interesting. It's all those people are fascinated with our state. Every two, is, three years. It's amazing to me. We're, just, we're much more common sense state with, with good, strong business fundamentals. Like capital and private, private sector capital investment. Even just progressive slash conservative enough. You know what I mean? You know, that you can get some things done. You know, Connecticut, you know, Connecticut people all in flat to the border. You know, New Yorkers, New York. Uh, it's a, you can, you can buy a great home. You know, great well, home that's what they were talking about. So we, we, the Medal of Honor Museum, we just hired Joe Daniels, who was the president of 9-11. Oh. Mm -hmm. Museum, oh, awesome. Mayor Bloomberg, a point, he was working there and he made him the, the president or whatever. He's coming, he's moving to Charleston. Going to take take it on. He's a young guy, but um, you'd like him a lot. But well, I mean, it's, he said the same thing. All those people. So we were up there Sunday and Monday, and everybody I was talking to, and they were just obsessed with South Carolina. It yeah. is crazy. I mean, they really are. I was with Griffin this morning a few weeks ago. I speak to another group in California. That's where that's where I'll be next week. And. Um, Historically, we, we, we've elbowed into the conversation now. I mean, Columbia has the mission. Uh, you know, it's, it's been, you know, Greenville, Charleston, Greenville, Charleston. You know, we're, we're, we're in the town now. And I think that's, that's, that's the reason I'm doing this New York thing. Um, but yeah, I think about May, May 8th, I'll have some show answers over here tomorrow. Well, they're, 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 you know, so like, I didn't realize Carl had an office in Charlotte. We're close enough to Charlotte, we don't have these folks. 
because when I explained to her the distance between Charlotte and Columbia and the mountains and the shore, she was like, yeah. HPC, Solar, Apollo, Al Rock, you know, Al Rock's principal has a house at Sullivan's. Mm -hmm. And his wife graduated from South Carolina at the time we did. And now he's become this big mm -hmm. Gamecock fan and this and that, which is, it's interesting. Well, do we know when Tamika was getting back? Uh, no. Should shortly. And, I, and, I, and, I, and I've got about, I probably only got two minutes or so. I thought you were the one who called for the 9 a.m. meeting. Huh? <laughs> That's a lot of Is it really? Yeah. <laughs> Don't forget to send that text and let me know. Oh, yeah. I got to go to, I got a 1230 minute. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I got Ready when you are, Missy. Okay. Just As you sit there and, 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 and gaze at us. Yes, I was. I was. I know you're being taking your cue. We'll make sure we. <laughs> okay, so our last item for today is discussion of the general fund. We have not yet brought you the general fund, other than revenues. Um, revenues have not. We have not made really any changes to our revenue projections since we last brought them to you. Of course, we still have um, business license tax coming in to evaluate um, as one of the items. But otherwise, revenues right now um, are still still at the same level we had produced to you earlier, which is 144 million. The budget that's proposed right now, or that's this is actually reflective of what's been requested. That means this is not the city manager's proposed budget, and of course, the budget is an imbalance. But this is what the budget that is, is the full request at this point. Um, we didn't show you this graph last time with regards to revenues, but did want to did want to just. Gen demonstrate to you these are the primary sources of revenue for the general fund you can see our our property taxes you know we're seeing some growth there both in collections and in of course what we budgeted um, over some recent years probably not the kind of growth we would anticipate or like to see but we'll we'll evaluate that of course further before we bring you back another iteration of the budget business licenses and permits we've seen some you know some some steps there as well in terms of growth also, our from other agencies, which represents uh, a big chunk of that, is going to be um, state shared revenues, which, as we all know, is not funded at the full um, um, formula, um, but at least at this point has steadied off. Where, where we're seeing probably the meekest area is going to be our fines and forfeitures, um, which is um, – actually, I skipped over current service charges – those reflect pretty flat. That's an area where we think that we have some opportunities in, in the sense of the services. Um, are, are, those, are the, those are basically user fees, and there's obviously a number of funds and number of activities in the general fund that are user-based. Um, but, of course, those are, are set, um, are, 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 are pretty minimal in terms of comparison to the entire total budget. Well, like I said, lastly, the, I'm sorry, go ahead. saying there are areas that we have not uh, Taking advantage of some, they're small, but the the revenues that they generate are small as well. Uh -huh. For instance, park parks and recreation fees, yeah. um, some solid waste fees, some small, you know, some 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 of those type of things. You know, our user fee type of activities. We can give you more description as we need to, but mm -hmm. um, there are some opportunities there. They're just not going to be big mm -hmm. generators. Now, cost recovery and getting this more cost recovery is is some areas that we uh, may want to talk about at some point too. Um, then, like I said, fine, fines and forfeitures, we're seeing a steady sort of, it, it's flat to almost minimal, um, and actually reductions. In fines those, and forfeitures. Fines and forfeitures. That's, What's the reason behind that? Well, be, I'm be sure. frank, please. I imagine there's a number of different reasons I can tell you specifically, some of, it, some of which is the ability to pay, perhaps. Some of it is the ability to tr of the actual fines being administered to, to the cases. Um, in terms mm -hmm. of charging, you know, the, for the offense. Mm -hmm. are, are we able to track exactly 
whether or not we're actually assessing mm -hmm. fines at all. We can find that out for you. I think, well, no, it's one thing to know if it's a collections issue. It's another thing to know if, it's, mm -hmm. uh, if we're not, if our judges are yeah. assessing them. I think if when, I appro remember, when appropriate. Yeah, I think, I think one of the struggles we've always had is you remember we, we looked at third-party collection and so forth, and we've never been able to, to get that. I mean, I think there's, what, $2.5 million worth of outstanding fines out there. And then, you know, I know L is not here, but yeah, I remember that. Yeah, that's, a that's just a number I was told. That would be parking. That's not that's Court fees and stuff. Oh. Well, to the best of my knowledge, we don't need to. When we set up the collection agency, <laughs> an L would be for parking. Yeah, well, the, and the reason I brought up parking is, is just an example is I had an outstanding ticket. They had my driver's license, I mean, my license plate, but no, I never got a letter, never got anything. Because they didn't have our address, we are not integrated to track people down. So when we set up the collection agency years ago, we did. We were told that we couldn't do parking tickets at that time because they were a citation. So we were not allowed to use the collection agency for that. We have talked with legal about it. I think we're still waiting on an opinion um, because we just set out an RFP for a new collection agency. Um, we do set off debt for water, sewer bills, but, you know, some things for um, code enforcement, but that's about it. You can do it for fines and forfeitures also? We have never used used it for municipal court. That's why I was surprised. Now, if you're talking about the citations, that's one thing, but if you're talking about the fines for municipal court, that Fines and, and, no. and the, because we had looked at a service several years ago mm -hmm. and Judge told wouldn't allow it, even though she got the bulk of it, which made no sense to me whatsoever. Um, I think we need to revisit that because, you know, that that was, you know, that paid for all the, you know, monitoring, all that stuff that we did. We, you know, we, we there's a lot of money sitting there. Mm -hmm. I'll check. I'll send a thing over. You said see our court know. costs aren't going down, and court definitely funds. our jail <laughs> <laughs> costs aren't going down. In a recent memo, Dana sent something to us about position and the Chief Justice's position of yes. fines and fees. It I have to go back and review it. Requirements of uh, delaying a trial because of the lawyer, uh, the defendant requests the lawyer and you have to reschedule it and then you got to give them another couple of chances. But it also mentioned in there set off debt. Mm -hmm. And uh, according to the Municipal Association, it was not a big change in the set off debt because I, I saw that in Dana's memo and check with them. Yeah, I don't know that she, we use it for water and sewer, but I don't know that it's being used for anything else. Well, you can. We'll check with and you, we also need to realize that the, a lot of this might be going back to our people that we put on our municipal court. If, if we put people on the municipal court that are all prosecutors or former prosecutors, they're not going to be as uh, heavy on some of our uh, cases as if we had people that were not biased towards the defendant. Uh, that that figure that we have is very low compared to other cities that I'm aware yeah, of. Yeah, that's why. And I think it goes back to our judicial body over there. Well, was that a long way of saying we have a bunch of defense attorneys and not, not prosecutors? Well, I was saying? doing, I was saying that diplomatically. Okay. But I think the bias towards the, uh, I was against the police and for the defendant. I'm married to a former prosecutor who was a fantastic municipal judge for many years. <laughs> um, uh, but, uh, yeah, but I'd still, I've, too, let's get the let's, livability let's court. It would be, it'd be worthwhile seeing what's been assessed yeah. um, previously, and then also at least let's take a look at uh, uh, Charleston, North Charleston, just to get an idea. We're doing some of that yeah. too. What the numbers look like, comparatively. The well, projection other, right now is one eight. Other, one other thing on that, uh, I know that there are some municipal municipalities that, when a judge has gotten his four-year, I think the law says either a two-year or four-year commitment. I have to look, look that closely. But it's, let's say it's a four-year commitment that you, instead of reappointing them. Let them serve as pleasure counsel. Uh, 
because they serve until their successor is qualified. Uh, and then you have a little bit more ability to talk to those judges about uh, we need to be unbiased in our opinions mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. That's the same thing the senators do with magistrates. There's a whole bunch of magistrates that are not reappointed, but they continue to serve. And then there's under the thumb of the senator. Uh, hmm. That's interesting. I understand that. Processes. Are yeah. sure that All right. We'll look up, look at for more information for you on that. Okay, so the general fund requested budget at this point, as mentioned, is not in balance. Um, departments are always instructed to prepare their budgets, maintaining current service levels and trying to maintain what we currently do, not necessarily always adding to or decreasing, depending upon um, um, their current service levels. Of course, there are some times where there are are, are reasons where there are some increases in service levels. But of course also too trying to meet the, the goals of the Envision Columbia plan. The total requested budget at this point is 159 million, which is a $17 million or 12% increase over the current year budget. And this, this reflects no changes in health care, correct? It does reflect changes in health care. Departments had a $2,000 over two, that 17 million over 2 million of it is increases in health care. Right, but that's what I'm saying is, is this doesn't, re so whatever changes we make will have a direct effect on This that. is based on assuming um, everything kind of cl work. Yeah, claims at, at the current kind of level as well as um, our costing at the current level. Yes, if, if we make changes based upon earlier discussions today and other things that can have an effect on this budget. Oh, well, it have a big effect. Well, if the forecast this morning for the OPED part was 19 million if we do with option yep. one. Yeah, that and, and that's not all general no, that's fund. Not That'll general be fund. amongst all the funds. Okay. But general fund is over half, right? So you, you're talking about $10 million maybe. Somewhere in there, yeah. yeah. So y'all are telling us well, option one A. Is that what you're telling me? <laughs> <laughs> right. So $17 million. <laughs> Uh, dollar increase, you said? $17 million increase. That's just what's requested. Of course, by the time we balance the budget, it's going to look a lot different. Um, also, part of that equation is increase in state retirement, which is um, about a million and a half of this increase. Um, that's increased in here as well. So department's request, just department's um, request is $135 million. That's $12 million increase over the current year budget, or 10%. And as mentioned, all departments, everybody with an employee reflects an increase both in health care and state retirement. The non-departmental, the other portion of the budget is $6.4 million, $1.1 million of that increase, or 22%, and the major, that's pretty much all related to our capital lease program. We, our goal is to, is to fund $8 million every year in a capital lease, which um, is not a lease per se, it's a capital lease purchase program. Um, and in, Current fiscal year, we only were able to do four million, which means we're behind in the, some of the capital we need to replace. So we're trying to maintain that, getting it back at least to the eight million um, that's needed every year. And of course, that adds to um, there's equal revenue of eight million and an equal expense of eight million. But the debt service is where there's going to be the reflecting the ink, what's making up this increase. So then transfers out. I'm sorry. So transfers out totals three point three million. I mean, uh, $17.8 million, which is a $3.3 .3 million increase, or 23%. And again, that's the increase on capital replacement going from $4 million to $8 million. There's also an offsetting revenue for that. So if we don't fund all $8 million in the capital replacement, the re equal revenue will also come down off of that. The bottom portion just sort of shows you how our costs are broken out by major categories, with personnel service being... Um, at 100 million of the 159 million, um, of course, the general fund is the largest employer of our funds in terms of the number of positions. And of course, <coughs> we are a service industry, so the majority of the cost is and will always be personnel cost with regards to the general fund, and that makes up both salaries and fringes and benefits. Operating expenses are at 8.9. Those are consumable items, gasoline, office products. Materials, um, um, non-capital tools or, or equipment, 
Coca-Cola's for the stand. Yeah, probably. Team council. One and a half minutes. What's that? Is that, is that, I'm with, which category? Well, it's probably our power bill. That's the next category. The next it's category It's the only building service. in the city of Columbia that's set at 75 degrees year round. The next category is service expenses, and that's 19.5. My that house would never be this way and warm. Electricity. Get a sweater. Contracts for services. I, I, I read where you mentioned, you know, the, uh, I, I think it's a, a request of like 23 new personnel yeah, positions. Mm -hmm. Have we evaluated our current personnel for, to justify the needs and what those services are for? And I'm curious to see, is there a breakdown in um, 23 with, with, with departments and... I didn't break it down in the memo, but this fell down in the memo. Twenty of those positions, twenty-three of those positions, um, are nine one one. Yeah, mm -hmm. you did say that. Mm -hmm. That's a fairly. I mean, that's that's. Twenty of those positions are nine one one. Ten call takers and ten telecommunicators. Now, actually, that's total between city and county. So we actually split that. So it's not total. So ten would be the city, and if we only fund half. Of How many positions. people do we have now? Seventy-eight or eighty. Where are we with that? Yeah, that many people. And that budget is split 50-50 with the city and the yeah. county. That's because it's 24-7. Yeah. Yeah. For every turn, we need five people. Not all of them are call takers and telecommunicators. Some of them also are the administrative staff. Um, they've also, of uh, course, they've... some efficiency and effectiveness measures in 911 already? I mean, trying to... Uh, I improve, we improve our service there, and also looking at uh, this, this this cooperative, the new cooperative agreement with the, with the, with the county. So we if, we, are, if, if we're doing that, then how do we justify paying for twenty more positions? Well, this isn't well? the final, so we, that may be one of the items that we'll have the discussion taking off. I had just received correspondence from the county interim administrator this morning. Um, they're asking for us to just renew the nine one one contract for another year, as we. Continue the discussion with the collaboration, bring everything together, and that would that would put a halt to adding twenty new positions. I guess, I guess if, if, if we if, if we're talking about yeah. running a more efficient operation, more responsive, how do we justify yeah. right. paying for twenty new positions before we've done that? No, we we agree. We're going yeah. through all the various yeah. items right now. Right. Just this is what makes up this amount. Right. By the time we come back to y'all in May. <laughs> um, well, just know we're looking. We're down, sure. we're down, no, we're down I, I, from 20. The questions you're asking are the good input that we need to, to, to put all this together. I, I should say they so asked, they've they asked for these fund, these positions for a couple of years because they the last increase in positions they received was 2012, I believe. Yeah. Um, and, of course, you know their, their call volume grow is, has also gone up. So they're processing a million calls, dispatching 500. And then they get... Uh, another big chunk of their work is FOI requests on a daily this is, uh, basis. So on their side, our side. But across the board, that's the entire operation. So as long as we need to be equally invested, so whatever you know, both parties do for the right. health, you know. But I mm -hmm. think you also, if we do make this joint and it changes, we need to understand what the effect that has on these people that are being hired as well. Because I mean, it'd be. And and devastating that is the, number one to them, and then the second part is is last October we asked for all the information on the jail because we constantly are, I mean, the number is quite large now mm -hmm. for our portion, and we have yet to ever receive the first financial send of the bill document. Yeah, it's got a bigger bill. That's what it. Is. Yeah, that's what they do. They send it to us, and if we did the same thing to the county, they would. I mean, it's six hundred thousand dollars now. And actually, their 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 amount has increased every year, but the number uh, rapidly. Of inmates, but the number of inmates has increased. Not, the number of inmates and the number of days actually in has not increased. So that's the only reason why we're able well, to even sustain at six hundred. Well, well, th well, the struggle I have and I've always had with it is this is true. We pay for the jail and our property tax. The city 
residents paid for the jail to be built through the bonding when it's done. And we get, but we pay extra. And, and to me, that's not acceptable. And, and if we can't get an accounting, we're not paying it. They have to take our prisoners because it's an agreement, and that agreement is when we built it. And so, Jeff, as you speak to intern, we need to get those numbers and we need to understand these costs. And we want to know what everybody else is paying. And if there is increased costs, is the county paying its equal share of those increased costs? Because I don't think we're, how many prisons do you think we are percentage-wise? Well, we have the highest call volume. Right. Uh, but I, as like Missy said, our arrests, uh, we had over 6,000 arrests last year. I, I haven't actually looked at our monthly average. I didn't bring that, yeah. But it's, it's been, it's, it's remained pretty flat over the last few years. I, I, right. We could probably tell you the number actually more than me, but. Yeah, so we, we get it. We get an, in, we, our invoice is detailed in the sense of the inmates that are coming in and the ones that are being charged to, I mean, it's pretty detailed. It doesn't tell us about the entire operations of the jail. All, all that is an invoice. Under well, the that's what they're made. justifying the cost right. increase. But I mean, if you look at what we paid ten years ago and what we're paying today, right. well, the rate the rate started at twenty five and it's going up to forty five, and then after that, it will increase on a percentage of operate percentage of cost. Just average cost average. Well, I agree with, with Daniel. Let's get the let's get that information. Sure. We'll get that. What, what's uh, the the capital request? Let's talk about that a little bit. Um, okay. 1.7 million. What, what does that look like? What, what are we talking about? So some of the a large portion of that, most of our capital is replacement capital bought through our capital lease replacement program. Mm -hmm. Typically, these would reflect capital not part of that replacement, either because they are new items adding to the inventory, or they are above and beyond what needs to be sort of is on the replacement schedule. So a large chunk of this 1.7, actually about 1.2 of it, is for emergency operations. Um, a mobile command unit and some other facilities there. And, 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 and I, can we get a Emergency briefing on that? I mean, that just seems to me that, I mean, is that something that we need to invest in today? A million and one <coughs> new command units estimated at 770. Mm -hmm. And then some aerial. And Ballard's that would be actually installed for. Installed versus mobile, I think that's still to be determined. Portable, I should say. And that's used, that's for use in all emergency situations, not just inclement, not just storms, but whatever. Crowd controls. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the biggest chunk, the over seven hundred fifty thousand of that, is a mobile command unit. I mean, an increase of one point two million for, for, I mean, that's that's a purchase. That's one time. That's one of the one time purchases. That's one of the one time that purchases. That's one time purchase. And of course, there are you know there's other ways to sort of look at funding for those type of items. That's not, that's not, that can't right be now, this through, is just a cash. And that can't be funded through CDBG uh, DR. I mean, uh, prospectively, if that's what I mean. Not the current action plan, but it's something we can consider as part. We can look through for the action plan. We also there's a number of grant mechanisms. There ha well that have been in place. Some of those have dried up, but we can certainly explore other grant opportunities and look at the DR, especially since um. This latest allocation that's yet to be coming is intended for mitigation type of purposes. So it's it's how it sort be, of fits into it's there. It's going to be incredibly helpful. Right. It was helpful last time. Was it? Yeah. Those guys are brought one in. Yeah, we are. We are. We are. We are. We are. Certainly these would be more of those crowd crowd control activities versus the inclement weather in terms of okay. mobile, mobile activities and the aerial types of things. Okay. And again, you know, these are, we, we don't, usually the budget when we come, kind of, especially by the time we bring you the proposed budget, these requests have been scaled back significantly. Um, obviously, some of these requests are, are, are warrants additional com consideration and, and review. Of course, we have to balance that between existing and maintaining operations and, and programs. I just, I'm sorry. It's got a bunch of memos. I have it, Erica. So, 
I mean, basically everybody's got increases, which I mean I can see because we're we're growing, but you know. You know, we have to cut cut to this. Just be frank, y'all, pretty deep. I mean, we uh, we just out of whack with these this many new requests against the revenue we see coming in. We're just not gonna be able to do it. And I know, obviously, you guys have shows everything. We appreciate that, but hopefully, when you come back, you've uh, taken a deeper look. And that's how our that's process right. usually is. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously we want to be able to share with you what we have. Of course, you know, a few things to point out. The, bu the budget at this point, the $15 million deficit is made up both of revenues and expenses. The revenue side, we're not yet reflecting a $3 million use of fund balance. Um, we have to look to make sure that $3 million is going to be available for the next year. Of course, we, our goal is to eventually wean ourselves from that. Um, so that we're not budgeting at the deficit, but we're not at that point. The other item, um, too, like we said, we've got a few other tweaks we need to make to revenues. On the expense side, there are, we do not yet reflect the credit that we'll get from the state for the state retirement system. At this point, it is still in the budget. So we can expect that. That'll be about six hundred dollars to $700,000 benefit to the general fund. So that will help. Of course, Mr. Rickman, as you mentioned, all departments reflect an increase. Um, on average, just the health and retirement increase is six to seven percent. Right. That re so any of those that you see that are outside of that six to seven percent, or that are there in that range, that's the only requested increase that they have is for the. But when you look at and I'll just just if you just pull out parks and recs, you know we're going to get park rangers for Bull Street. Is that really necessary at this point? It's so not. The park's what? not even complete. It'll be open September. But and I mean, it's not it's, just Bull Street. It's there's some other of the Greenway use and some other ranges, but it's opening in September for that green space. So there'll be more than just that. Um, but that's the you know, and, the then, and then looking at the component units, you know, it, it, at some point, you know, we continue to, to to fund these these groups, and I guess the question really comes down to is, you know, we probably ought to get briefed on what the return is. <laughs> In these units, and what the activity is, uh, and I noticed in two in um, the OBO office is asking for a significant amount of money as well. Um, that comes into leadership, you know that, huh? That comes into leadership. Yeah, but no, I think you know what's interesting though is just trying to understand some of our our programs. You know what. You know, additional facade grant, you know, that a lot of requests for that. We, and we've been trying to rotate that. The micro loan program, you know. But, you know, we're going to do another updated disparity study to assist developing the updated goals, you know, in the SMBE. And I guess my question, you know, there is, is we've done these mentoring programs, we're doing this, but yet we're not seeing the return or the growth of a lot of these businesses and, and so how do how do we how do we leverage what we already existing have to make sure that we're getting there? You know, we've done this mentoring program at the in the wastewater and everywhere and but we're not seeing people get over to that next level. I think we do a tremendous job of making sure that we're inclusion in everything. I mean I do think we are by far great, but I guess, you know, you start looking at this as is have we measured actually we results do? of what we have first before we in, embark in a new quarter million dollar study? And that's one of the items that we would consider one time and possibly breaking out if, if it were desired to go there, breaking out maybe over two fiscal years if needed. Um, but again, it's still coming up with the. I mean, we just we have a lot going on, and as we move forward, and you know adding positions and new roles and stuff, we need to understand how that affects all the other team members in here because, you know, we got a lot of infrastructure to take care of as well. The solicitor probably doesn't need that 215000 next year. He's not going to be traveling as much. <coughs> Move that time we stricken from the record. <laughs> no, she probably won't, but I, I looks like I've got some. She's just giving us our review. Huh? Yeah. To make it. What page? Uh, uh, she, slide 15. Slide 15. 
it's probably page <laughs> seven. You've got two. Uh, well. Um, do you still have maintaining the million dollars in for hospital for homeless services as well? I don't have that listed here. Um, and then we, we have not yet reflected any funding for our general capital projects. Of course, that's what's used to update our parks, update city um, facilities, um, anything that's going to be general fund uh, related. Um, our fire stations, police substations. Um, we don't have those requests here for you, but there are. We do have uh, obviously capital requests as well. Historically, council has often funded. We we try to fund those in cash in the budget, but then also to funding them from any fund balance if and when it's available. It's also used for our roads, trying to uh, maintain a, a level of um, often requested is five hundred thousand to be able to annually appropriate towards road resurfacing and rebuilds, and then sidewalks. Can, um, I'd be remiss if we didn't at least mention that in here. Well, in addition to mentioning it, though, can we make sure that we have what that list is before Certainly. we start making any um, allocations to outside groups? Absolutely. We're not reflecting anything at this point with regards to outside groups other than in terms of, like, community promotions. The only outside groups that are in here are those things that are, like, contracted for, like with the, the, ten, the detention center and the solicitor and homeless services and things like that. Most of the, we haven't brought, but um, there's also no funding for those. We need to tell the people that have been getting community promotion money not to have any this year. You didn't have any this year. We told people that last year. I know. We <laughs> need, should have stayed here. Yes. Um, hmm. is, um, let's see, is the, um, and I know it depends on whether or not it makes the cut. I understand that, but, um, is my request for uh, the um, wealth gap study in here? Not that I'm aware of. Can we put that on the table? The what? The wealth gap study. Oh, that was before you got here. Um, hey, everything was before I got here. Um, yeah. Um, I, I need, we need 50000 to contract for a study on the wealth inequalities within the community so that we know that we're What programs are you referring um, to? Like CDBG and just all of our programs because, I mean, we, we kind of know, but we don't necessarily know. Um, just we, we, like what I shared with everybody last year, like Boston did um, a wealth inequality study and they found that the, the wealth gap was so big, you know, it would take generations to actually bring people to the same level. But it helps you target some of your, like, for instance, the child savings account that we talked about yesterday, but, you know, if you're, it helps you figure out programs like that can help teach kids younger, then they'll be in a better footing to make better financial decisions, or, you know, some of the programs that we're about to do with our employees, we know, you know, how that's helping them build wealth versus just paying their bills. I support that. I mean, I'd, su I'd support um, helping fund that. We could probably also find some philanthropic money that might help us. I mean, there's a whole lot of focus on equity and inclusion and, and, and getting good data to support the kind of decisions uh, we're talking about. We're talking about making several million dollars worth of investment right. based on that data. So I think it's, I think it's smart. And it's, it's, it, it, it's in challenging times, y'all. We're watching a, an economy that's growing and, and, and booming in some, in some regards, uh, but we're also watching the, the wealth gap uh, grow as, as growing. the benefits from that growth go more to capital than, than to labor. So you can work hard, as hard as you possibly can. But you can't keep up and catch up, and it's it's a, it's, a, it's a major challenge. That data is helpful. I've got a couple ideas. Maybe some places we could also get at least a portion of that money. And maybe if if, if we if we put some of the money up, maybe we could get some of those more money up. Yeah, match it. Inside, inside. But in, in that in that instance, in your in your comment, one of the challenges that we've had with labor in Columbia and in our own programs is, is too, is, is, is helping educate people that, you know, if you can't pass a drug test, you can get yeah. hired. Yep. 
you know, that has been a challenge with every city program we put together on training. And, and a lot of the business Absolutely. community are saying the same thing. It's, it's not a lack of labor here. It's a lack of... Particularly for the jobs that are not spread. Credit. Uh, yeah. Uh, mid, mid skilled jobs that pay pay a good living, uh, earn a good wage. Uh, can't pass a, a P-test. But I think it would be good for us to help yeah. if we're leaning into those programs to make sure that we, we, we tackle all aspects of it. Mm -hmm. And it's part of that education program. That really concludes the highlight or overview other than talking about next steps and our next so when steps. when we get in the line by line items in the, the fluorescent fins. We gave them to you last year, we can give it to you. Or the red ink. The red ink, fluorescent fins. Yeah, you're gonna, you're, gonna, you're gonna take a swipe at this or you want us to play with and send you some thoughts or you want? Or both. Well, I think we've heard some thoughts from you today. Um, of course, you know the when we bring you back a budget, we'll reflect those things that you all have expressed an interest in or, or, or um, want to yeah. see going forward. I mean, yeah, in some, in some things, you guys, take, take a, let's take a really serious swipe at these. We're not buying another vehicle for public relations. I mean, you know, we've, got, we've got cars sitting in our garage over on a regular basis. Let's figure out how we can pull them and use them a lot, a, a lot more easily. And let's, let's, let's dig deep and, and figure out how we can uh, make some things happen. Of course, the health care is another component. Yeah. And then I mean, some we have those, some additional those. swipes at revenue. Well, I think we're going to have to tackle that one very quickly. Yeah. Can you all get the best you can done? I'd like to have an online item, too. Like help, me, help me understand how council support services budget goes down because it's a non-election year. 150,000. There was 150,000 in for the election. Uh, 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 okay. Say what? Well, maybe we'll, we'll say that then. Say that. Say that then. Uh, I, had, I had to think about that one. I thought it did. I'm sorry. I thought it did say non-election year. It is what it says, but I'm no, thinking. I'm thinking. I want to serve services. You, know, you, services you go occasionally. Up, I, I occasionally. Did I forget see to that apply almost. for some grant yeah, money? Yeah, I was wondering too. Uh, yeah, non-election year. That's hilarity. That's hilarious. I think our biggest thing at this point is just discussions of the schedules and bringing things back. What I'm hearing is an interest in starting earlier on the 15th. Um, yeah, that'd be great. Okay. For me. And then we could bring I back. Mean, if we can meet I mean, before then to now. kind of tackle the great. Maybe meet, in terms of meeting like some of these specific projects or some of the specific, uh, some of those. Um, We're doing talking health care. Yeah, I think we're going to uh, talk to. Um, missing everyone else. Let's make sure the requests we have from the Quiet Zone uh, Committee as well, whatever work. I mean, there, obviously there's some there's some federal funding uh, that we think might be available too. But let's let's take a look at that and make sure that the, the uh, at least fact in and make the decision making process. Uh, also, some of the other requests. For example, the the first um, facade program we did was funded by CDBG. I think it's about four hundred twenty grand or so we did downtown. There's actually a hundred thousand in the general in their budget now. This hundred thousand in that's mentioned here is to increase it to two hundred. There's already a hundred in their budget. Okay. Uh, the with but with the so some of it was CDBG. Yeah. But with the significant and unanticipated increase that we got, we're going to get in CDBG and other funds uh, because of the omnibus bill. Uh, is that some place we can we might be able to find those funds as opposed to. Funding from the general fund. Sure. And I'll, I'll put some other notes down, but but if we if we're able to benefit from some of the federal resources and being used appropriately, let's get the general fund some. some I, I know we're going to get a, a, a new uh, red line version that's going to make us all very proud. <laughs> when we miss the note, we, we, miss, we miss. This is what happens, what happens when Mr. Yeah. No is no longer Mr. No for a few weeks, and uh, uh, he's going he's, he's going to shift right back in, into into Mr. No. <laughs> on that, there there will be other things that we'll be following up as well on, on revenue. You all may have noticed there's a lot of talk on the change, the electric fees, the state house. That will have an effect on our franchise fee as well. So we're going to have to think about those going forward. Uh, the, Say that again. Then what? What's what's they decrease the, they, the franchise fee? If if the state forces electric fees to go down, our franchise fee will go down as well. Yeah, I saw that. So that can um, have a significant effect as well. We can raise well. taxes to get it back. No, you can't. 
Well, you can raise taxes within the con constraints of Act 388. So that's just a few mills. How many mills do we have left? That's a good question. I'll have to, I don't know if we've updated that. It's going to yeah. be right around four to five. Yeah. Maybe well, just with five mills. In terms of what we have in the bank. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I assume you mean yeah. the, the total bank of yeah. yeah. CPI. <laughs> Uh, we have a question. Where are we with the light? Look at. We started off as a street light fund that we started calling the Smart City Fund. To pay for new services, right? I've got a. Um, yeah. We're looking at that. Um, Figure out a way to collect it. Yeah, we would like to, but we've kind of been focused on just trying to get the current general fund and what we're doing. So the 15th, what we're going to do on the 15th? By then, we will either have brought you we, a, um, a balanced budget or a budget that can be balanced with some options for city council to consider on how it's balanced. Right. But it would be significant. What was that? What was that? The question was, what were we doing on the 15th? So when we come back on the 15th, what, what we time, I mean? Oh, I'm what sorry. I thought you were about what we'd actually be bringing back to you. I think, I think earlier the better. Yeah, does, does, this, does this also include, I know there's a revenue generating um, issue that Robert put on the table a few weeks Several we just ago. talked about that. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm Daniel and I were. I think the biggest, subject. yeah. How much, the, was, how much street, was that? The street light fee. I, the question is whether it's to cover just new or if it's to cover existing. That seems to be what was just being discussed. Lighting? Mm -hmm. how much, what, was the, what was the potential? It was revenue? like a $5, five dollar, um, $2 million, right at $2 million? $2 million. $2 million. Yeah. But then, of course, it's a matter of how we collect. It's not... Was it really revenue? Or Two million it really would it be if we affected be do it July even. one, but I don't know if it would be July one that we would. It's a break even in terms of the cost. So, yeah, well, but we're not we're not earning anything on, on the lighting that we install. No, well, we we pay S C and G at least. Jeff, Except where are we on the four thousand parcels of non tax paying entities and how we are going to address that? Was in the legislature. Yeah, we're we're kind of struggling how to address that because the state took a look at uh, oh. certain, not all four thousand parcels, but they were taking a look at universities and, and, and hospitals. So they reached, it. Kind of looks like that's dead. Um, What's preventing uh, us right. from, from charging a fee well, we're that go is back. more comparable to what our homeowners are having to pay? The four thousand uh, parcels exempt. tax exempt. What what would prevent us as a city from assessing a fee to those properties mm -hmm. that equal what our homeowners pay? Four, that's, that's four percent, right? Yeah. yeah. That 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 is something we can go back to in our discussions on that. Um, things that we have learned, it can't be a flat fee. It has to be based on some sort of value. Look at the look at the look at let's take this back of envelope numbers and some recommendations as a formula. Okay, that was going to be my. My question also, um, but does the state have a say so? And if we do that, given what, what they're trying to do, well, they would not. It was sure. a local. Okay. It was a it was a Midlands they representative that proposed it. Yeah. So there was another number uh, as we look at these, uh, this, but let's just some back of the envelope numbers. Maybe just like a different formula that that. Mm -hmm. that Obviously, passed legal muster. If we were to look at that, and I think also we we, we were looking at the Dominion buyout. If that were to come to pass, I think every day is a different story at the state capitol. What that also might mean in terms of um, uh, revenue to the city as a as a as a rate payer. Mm -hmm. uh, You're talking about if they make the payment up front. Yes, I think. I think did we get an estimate? I think we did get an estimate. It's one time. And so we'll, obviously, we'll, and obviously we'll look at that as well. Obviously, it's one time, but but I think this budget also includes a number of one-time expenses. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, we we but need anything that's capital or anything. Bunch of non-recurring expenses. Non expenses, yes. non -recurring expenses so. We need um, somehow to, to benefit from that. Plus, um, getting more requests and complaints about dark dark spots in the city. So we've got to invest somehow in that cost. To, to put up more lighting, um, and uh, people are, um, believe it or not, um, honestly feel that more lighting 
gives them some uh, sense of safety. Yeah, it does. They really do. Yeah. So I, I think that's one of the best investments we can make. So on the 15th, we'll bring you back the proposed budget. It will either be in balance or it will be balanced with options for city council to consider. Okay, so on, on the first meeting, probably should be. Tamika is going to have an evening meeting and we're going to take care of the consent agenda and some front. Can you get my text on that? Well, <laughs> he's not going to be here. I know. We're having an evening meeting. I'll preside. <laughs> and uh, just take care of the light stuff to like, unclutter. Because Daniel won't be here either. There, there's no be, there's no budget need, discussions planned for May. Right. We just need to verify that it'll be here so we have a quorum. Columbia, let's put her on the 15th because that that everybody be here. I know the chief has a, a grant. I'm sorry, were you talking? No, I was finished. We were just talking about the first. I was. I had asked that Miss Columbia, that Bet Lauren had asked too, that Miss Columbia be on the agenda for May 1st just to introduce herself on her platform. Mm -hmm. But I'd rather all be here so we can move that to the 15th. I think that's correct. We want to move. The um, uh, chief has a pending um, a grant with press. Mm -hmm. uh, he and Mr. Duvall have advanced, aggress aggressively advanced to one of our major nonprofits on to support ShotSpotter. And there's some really smart precision policing using data to help us uh, respond more effectively to gun crimes in the city. Chief of the Great Press Conference with Sheriff Watt uh, today as well on, on generally the same uh, topic. Uh, if, in fact, the grant opportunity doesn't work out, and it should, and our partners should step up and, and make it happen, we do need to seriously look at I mean, with some of the precipitous drops in, 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 in gunfire that, that other cities are seeing um, speak to the value of this, and it's something we ought to be investing in either way. To talk to the chief, and at the very least, let, let's make it a part of our discussions, and if we have to look at, at other parts of the city, hopefully we'll, um, we'll um, our nonprofit partners will step up one way or the other and, and uh, make it a reality. But we need to do it either way. Yeah. It, 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 need, it needs to be yeah. done. I mean, I'm, um, these guys always, no. they're getting no. texts from me at night. And I'll go ahead and say this to Chief. He's, he's a free shot spotter right now. He's what? Free. Free. <laughs> he calls you, he calls you every day. Yeah. <laughs> he pings you. I mean, I, yeah. It's, it's you. real out there, man. I mean, the data is, data is very real. I mean, the number of calls we get, increasing calls, obviously, the, the, um, in the reality that, that the vast majority of calls are never, are never shots are never reported. It tells you tells you that we that we have um, a lot of uh, issues out there. I, I know I sent some some of you who I, I probably harassed a little more than others. Um, um, Misty and Jeff probably more than anybody else. Uh, asked for some data around schools, um, uh, particularly. Uh, was, was, I'm not sure if I told you the entire story. I was curious about uh, data around gunfire in some of the zones that the proposal that. The, Chief and, and, and Howard had presented uh, in some of our neighborhoods. If there's some ability we had using the um, Gun Free Safe Schools Act, um, federal law, uh, to, to to potentially erect um, some of these um, um, shots by the sensors in and around some of these schools. Uh, so just thinking again, progressively, whatever we do, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we even got some pushback from from some state legislators or even on something as smart as, as, as this as we deal with this with this incredibly illogical uh, pro-gun fervor at the state capitol. So they seek to preempt us at every corner, every turn. But um, I'll follow, I'll send some follow-up emails on that, maybe to the whole council. But we, we got some, um, some respite in that federal law that gives us some room for some policy making that the state legislature can't undo under, under preemption, under, under, under supremacy laws. Right. And I, I want to talk about that a little bit more. So um, the system that we're looking at, can we get the, the uh, real-time video on it? It's it catches the shots. Well, yeah. But we can put some cameras on The system I saw in Chicago is where they have a... You know, real-time GIS. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. it, so it, it 
coordinate. And put it on the on the pole. Yeah. Yes. And, and, and guys in the, can do it in the That's car. Right. And yeah. Officer, officer right. get it on their computer. It'll right. Be, right. It'll, it'll be a little time. <laughs> I remember we were watching that and saw a drug pass on the street corner. Yeah. <laughs> well, we need to get this thing done in the next month or so, so we can have it up and operational this summer when you'll have more shots fired than any other time. Mm -hmm. uh, they, are, they are ready to do it. We just yeah. need to get a go. I don't know if I ever told you guys about um, over there behind the bus barn. We were always getting shots. Fire calls and didn't know what was happening. Oh, yeah. Back up in there. Um, it was like, next year, um, I'm talking range. shooting range. Oh. Still did. Oh, there are shooting range back there. <laughs> a lot of more men. Um, no. No. Off, um, of, uh, off of uh, River Rutledge. Yeah, Hammond, behind, behind Rutledge. Hammond, Hammond Village. But I don't think it was associated with it. Were you sportsmen or, or just really? I thought it was Rutledge. Yeah, yeah. sportsmen, yeah. Southern yeah, <laughs> urban <No>. sportsmen. <laughs> urban, <yeah. laughs> I mean, they were, they were yeah. packing it, man. So we would get calls, like mm. shots every night, and you know, nobody could figure out what was happening, what was right. going on. And thanks to the great work our officers did and making friends with folks down there mm -hmm. and going and looking, we mm -hmm. came up with one shooting range. Oh, no. Sorry. All right. I see you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Are we done? Or? Hey. <laughs> we're done. We're done. Yeah. I do want to. We don't get lunch. <laughs> sure. I'm not going anywhere. I got a 12:30 upstairs. Well, I got a 3:30. So get your meeting finished. If I'm still there at 3:30, I hope somebody shoots me. Three-hour meeting. I clean my clear my afternoon because I thought we were going to be all day. Pretty good. Okay. So. We just move right along while you look.